Good morning and welcome to the 10th uh, committee meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask everyone present to turn off electrical devices so they don't interfere with the sound system, please. Uh, the, we've received apologies from committee member Jackie Bailey and uh, the first item on the agenda is a decision to take items three and four in private. Are we all agreed to do so? Yes. Thank you. Now, we turn now to our inquiry into Scotland's economic performance. And uh, for our first panel, uh, we have, first of all, Dr. Diane Harbison, Chief Executive Officer of Stratified Medicine Scotland, Dr. David Bunton, Chief Executive Officer of Reprocell Europe, and Claire Mack, CEO of Scottish Renewables. Uh, may I welcome all three of you, and we'll shortly be joined by Gareth Wynne, who is a Stakeholder and Communications Director of Oil & Gas UK. So, uh, may I say, first of all, that uh, there's no need to press any buttons on your desk. That will be dealt with by the sound system when you speak. If you want to come into the discussion or an answer to a question, if you just indicate by raising your hand, and I'll um, bring you in as time and questions permitting. So... Perhaps I could start with um, a general question about the performance of the Scottish economy over the last 10 years and perhaps just canvas um, the views of each of you on that and perhaps start with Dr Harbison. Um, so I think um, the sector that we represent, life sciences, has performed very well over the last 10 years. Um, we have uh, a huge number of really interesting and innovative SMEs that have grown to become, become companies of size and scale, and David represents uh, one such company. Um, I think for us in Scotland, we have a really um, unique opportunity within the field that I work in, which is stratified medicine. And although we don't directly impact a lot of the companies that are working in Scotland, our influence is global. We work on well, the pharmaceutical industry. And for us, there's been a big change in that industry with the demise of the blockbuster model and a move towards more targeted therapies. So for us, we've seen a lot of, of change within the industry that has filtered down to companies like David's and, and others who are in the precision medicine, stratified medicine ecosystem. Thank you. And Dr. Bunton? I would ag agree with Diane that we've, we've seen a um, quite difficult spell after the, the Great Recession um, and uh, a recovery in the last two or three years. Um, this, the sector uh, that Repricel is in, in pharmaceutical services, that I, I don't have the figures for the last 10 years, but since 2010 has grown about 30%. Um, and much of that we're seeing over the past three, four years. So I think there's a very positive outlook in that the um, infrastructure, the, the skills that the, uh, you know, the working population has, and uh, Scotland's performed reasonably well in terms of investment out, outside of London. It's been one of the most successful for life science investment. So I think there's a lot of uh, positives, um, but certainly areas to to discuss where we can we can go further and opportunities that we can we can look to build on. Thank you, and Claire Mack. Thank you. Um, I think more more broadly, obviously, there's some key strengths in the Scottish economy um, that we've seen demonstrated over the last ten years. So our university sector is, is is acknowledged as one of the best in the world. We've also experienced good population growth, which has been helpful to the economy. We have seen quite a heavy concentration, I guess, in, in, in certain sectors, energy being one of them, as well as um, food and drink. So thinking more broadly about my own sector in terms of renewables, we've got quite a good story to tell. So we've seen installed capacity go up from about 3.3 gigawatts in 2008 to about 9.3 gigawatts in 2017. Um, a lot of the development there has been um, supported by strong mechanisms that enabled big long-term investments and essentially guaranteed um, a market price for our products. So those are the contracts for difference and, and renewables obligation systems that were in place um, by the, the UK government, which was good because it allowed renewables to buck the trend of the recession. Um, it somewhat insulated us, this kind of UK government mechanism, which meant that development and investment continued here in Scotland because the risks were mitigated. Good. Well, thank you very much. We'll turn now to questions from Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, convener. 
Uh, it's good to hear that Scotland has a bit of global influence and we've got key strengths, but can you just say to us, what do you see are the, the key opportunities and risks facing your sector and the Scottish economy over the next 10 years? I, I think there are a number of opportunities in, in life sciences that we um, should build on the, the areas of strength that we already have. I, th I think Scotland has been always been uh, at the forefront of innovation and really pretty good at predicting which areas of life science are going to be the next uh, hot areas of research and development. Mm -hmm. And uh, Diane, certainly in precision medicine is one of those. And it's I, I feel it's very important that we show a long-term commitment to that opportunity. And uh, perhaps in the past, we may have um, swung a little too much between different opportunities, but I think some of these areas, Diane will, will, will say more about precision medicine, but some of them, uh, such as regenerative medicine, um, and I, I know there was news yesterday about a, a trial in uh, macular degeneration. These are technologies that take a very long time to develop. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, as, a, as a Scottish uh, based company, been acquired by a Japanese company, I can see their um, the long term vision in, in Japan, where they uh, you know they're looking 20, 30, 40 years ahead, and so I think that we have to um, try and uh, strike that balance of the opportunity and the the risk that we the risk is that we pick the wrong areas to to invest in and focus on and, and build on, but I think we've got a pretty good track record in regenerative medicine is something we've we've really been building on in, in Scotland for a long time. Um, precision medicine in the last five to ten years and also now in uh, digital health care, um, the pharmaceutical services sector more more generally. Um, so I, I feel that we are in a, in a good position to, to sort of go forward from, from that point. So it, it won't surprise you to know that I agree completely with what David said. Um, for me, the two areas that David's highlighted in regenerative medicine and precision medicine are areas where Scotland has traditionally been very strong. Um, but these technologies, as David said, take a long, long time to develop and to, to commercialise. Actually, I worked on that project that the clinical trial has just had a, a positive outcome for, and I worked on that project in 2010. So it's taken all that time for that product to, to go from development to an actual clinical trial in patients where it's been shown to work. These patients were able to see again. It was amazing. So in, in the field of precision medicine, Scotland has a real opportunity here. We have a small, stable population. We have really good health informatics, some of the best health, health informatics in the world. We have world-leading clinical researchers. We have a real ability to really positively impact some of the diseases that are a major burden for the Scottish population. As you're all aware, we have um, a huge prevalence of many complex diseases in Scotland, and we have clinical expertise in those disease areas. And we also have pharmaceutical companies who are interested in trying to find cures and treatments for those diseases. So our really strong health informatics, our stable population, the CHI number, means that we are in a really unique position to capitalise on everything that we have here in Scotland and to really drive the growth of precision medicine approaches, which, again, will have a positive impact on the Scottish economy because it could impact very positively the drugs budget. If you're only prescribing drugs to patients who will benefit from that drug rather than <coughs> having a trial and error prescribing one-size-fits-all approach, you can reduce the amount of money that you spend on drugs you can give the right drug to the right patient, which means that they have more chance of taking that drug and more chance of, of, of being um, treated or, or um, having their condition managed. And I think that, for me, is the real opportunity. We are at the cusp here of, of being able to be a world leader in this, in this particular field, but other countries are catching up. All the countries around the world that you could mention are doing population-based sequencing studies. Before Christmas, there was an announcement from Finland. They're sequencing 500,000 Finnish people. They have electronic records. They're very, very similar in size of their population to Scotland. And they present, represent a real threat to us. But all countries around the world are doing this approach. 
And I think we have the opportunity in Scotland to be a world leader in this particular field. And as David said, digital health, given our, uh, our population in the remote parts of Scotland, digital and telehealth is a really important um, part of the life sciences sector that shouldn't be forgotten because, again, it could have major impact mm. on patients and how they're treated. And so in my sector, I mean, there's a lot actually of similarities, believe it or not, in there, which is that we also have a world leading renewable sector here in Scotland. Um, but likewise, because climate change is uh, has a global dimension to it, there are a lot of other countries who are looking to catch up who have similar levels of, of strong natural resource. So that's our first opportunity is that we already do have a world leading industry here and we've got very strong and abundant natural resources. The other opportunity that I want to talk about is, is again very similar to what we've just heard about in health and life sciences is um, our ability to have brought things through from innovation, so from lab to commercialisation. It is a long journey, but we have managed it in Scotland and renewables represents a really, really strong picture around all of that. So it's something that we need to be very clear about given we do have such a strong university sector. That capability is, is, is really, really important. In terms of um, risks, in terms of future growth, for us, the, the stabilisation, the revenue stabilisation mechanisms that I talked about from the UK government are currently not uh, allowing for what is our cheapest form of renewable energy, which is onshore wind, to compete for these revenue stabilisation mechanisms, which is certainly hampering the market. We've got a lot of estates up here in Scotland already and looking to develop a lot more to go through. Um, so that route to market is critically important um, for the renewable sector. The other thing that we are thinking about a lot within our sector is, is the supply chain. Um, the, the contract for difference mechanism is, is an auction process which is continually around about driving cost reductions and we're very mindful that these cost reductions can come from various different places and we're having to look at costs across the whole system um, to make sure that we can drive efficiencies without driving out value in terms of wages and being able to provide you know, exactly the kind of investments that we want to provide. Our investment timelines are very are very long, they're very risk heavy, um, and that contracts for difference mechanism allows that to happen. It unlocks that investment. So again, I come back to that kind of route to market. Again, looking again more at some of the more positive stuff in terms of opportunities, digital and smart systems, again similar to what we're talking about here, um, are, are going to be a huge part of the future. So in Scotland, we've, we've taken a leading role in terms of electric vehicles, and that will drive some of this new smart system innovation that we're talking about and investment in there. The other thing is where you think about turning sort of things that are weaknesses into strengths and grid in Scotland um, has, has particular constraints. We see a lot of people who are off grid in Scotland and obviously in our more remote and rural areas, the constraints within grid have meant that we've had to be more innovative earlier in Scotland. So we've got a particular strength in that area that we can demonstrate and utilise across, across the rest of the globe. I mean, you've all indicated that Scotland's at the forefront of innovation, but other countries are catching up. Are we? We heard last week from Professor Muscatelli that Scotland needs to significantly increase levels of research and development and in mm. innovation. So, I mean, do, do you see challenges in your sector as far as that's concerned? Can you I know, increase R and D expenditure, etc. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the key risks for us in terms of Brexit, um, which is that um, while we've had phenomenal support around the renewable sector from, from the Scottish Government and, and that is part of sort of the way that Scotland has developed its economy, a lot of the funding that we've seen, particularly for earlier stage innovation technologies such as Wave and Tidal, has come directly from the European Union, who also share our very high ambition in there. Um, and so that is a big concern because we've got companies like Nova Innovation here in in Scotland who've, who've managed to, to get really strong support from these funds for their technologies, which is allowing them to do the journey that I was talking about from innovation to commercialisation. Mm -hmm. So it is a big issue for us to consider. And I would say for us, uh, absolutely, it's, it's an issue. Our role as an innovation centre is to work um, between the university sector and the SMEs and industry and to help to translate those really exciting innovative ideas that the universities have into a commercial output. And I think funding for those projects and the ability to assist those companies is vitally important. And as the innovation centres, we were set up with, with a pot of money that, that we were allowed to use to seed projects. Our innovation centre worked with David um, on, on a really exciting project. And so having the ability to have that pot of money that you can do really innovative 
innovative and risky things because mm. very often you just don't know what the outcome of a project will be before you start. That's the whole point of science. Mm. So I think in order to have some money that can be used to seed really exciting and innovative projects, to me, is an issue. And again, the Brexit <coughs> issue raises that because there's a huge amount of European Union funding mm -hmm. that we can tap into that potentially we won't be able to, that could impact what we're doing. On the plus side, there is a lot of money from Innovate UK. For me in particular, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on precision medicine and data. Uh, we're also using an awful lot of, of, of data within the precision medicine field. So having access to money from Innovate UK is, is hugely beneficial to us, but then what we need is really innovative SMEs that we can work with who are prepared to take the risk um, and take the time to write the grants to get that money from Innovate UK. And all of these things take time, mm -hmm. and it has to compete against all the other things that they're trying to do as, as SMEs, which... Um, Grant writing is not necessarily very high up in their, their radars, and perhaps David can comment on that. I think, yeah, that's always a challenge to ensure there's sufficient investment at the early stage of company growth and for spin outs and startups. Mm -hmm. That that investment comes not only from uh, in, in, in Scotland, uh, venture capital, business angel networks, and Scotland's been very well supported by business angel uh, networks, mm -hmm. but also. Um, Scottish Investment Bank, which is most active investor in life sciences in the UK, and that, that support of match funding, mm -hmm. some of the early risk capital that's come from business angels or private investors, or in you know, most cases the mm -hmm. founders putting uh, their own money in, that's a matching investment for early stage R&D and getting those companies across that, that barrier from proof of concept into an actual commercial product and starting to generate revenue. It's a really, really tough phase. And I think we've, you know, Scotland's led the way in that. And again, I just want to you know, really emphasize how important that is to those spin outs and, and startups that we, we, we get them over that, that hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, the, the next challenge in that next phase of development more than research is the, the scaling up and the uh, the, the higher levels of investment, which, uh, again, we've, we've done well in total numbers of in invested companies, but perhaps not as well in the total value or the average investment that's been made into the companies, allowing them to grow more quickly. So uh, some of the, the funding uh, from, from Europe, Horizon 2020, SME Instrument, We've done okay, but perhaps not as well as we might. And it's important that we don't lose access to some of those uh, funding mechanisms, which can really help to uh, you know, take companies across that that first barrier of risk and then help them to, to scale up. And, and is that is that because we you know we've heard the evidence to say that the vast majority of SMEs are very very small in Scotland, and we're we're missing this middle section of middle range size companies is that part of the reason why we're having these difficulties and you mentioned i think that your company that you worked for where it was taken over by a japanese company mm -hmm. was that because of for that because that a, future a, financial investment was yeah, required yeah. yeah that was that was a means for us to achieve the level of investment yeah. that we needed yeah. um and you know they've been as good as a word and that's i, th I think something where it's it's, it's important that we we get that um, long-term investment yeah. from companies because we don't want to see that research base then uh, move into a different market and the mm. scale-up to happen elsewhere. Mm. Um, so it's mostly selecting which type of investors we attract and that we, we try and make it a, a, an attractive ecosystem. And that's that's been a, an, an emphasis for precision medicine is it's, you know, what's, what's attracting inward investment is not only the company that's it's the main thing is the company and the opportunity it represents but it's also that supporting ecosystem of the universities the nhs the the skilled um, um, uh, pool of talent in the, the country so it's trying to get all those things uh, together as a selling point point. Yeah. and my last question is um in relation to brexit both of you, a couple of you mentioned the fact in terms of finance that brexit's a difficulty but in terms of research and development, etc., there's a lot of collaboration goes on across Europe, and also there's access to skilled labour. Can you maybe say a wee bit of difficulties that that's going to face your sector in the next 10 years? 
We, um, we recently looked into this. So in our sector, we have a number of relatively large companies alongside the, the smaller businesses that operate just in Scotland who, who are internationally owned. So by their very nature, mm. um, they, they do operate globally. Um, for us, it's we don't use sort of volume low skilled work sort of like the sort of food and drink industry perhaps does we don't have a seasonal element to it so that's not such a, a big worry for us it is um, more to the high to mid skilled collaboration type roles that, that we are really concerned about and where freedom of movement would would certainly impact us um, it's in terms of the sort of global market if we want to develop these kind of subsidy free projects the any tariffs or barriers that come in as a result of that would be very very difficult for us as well um, in terms of you know trade barriers of course like that renewables and energy is in as a whole presents a bit of a brexit bridge actually for us um and here in scotland we we have to collaborate because that's the nature of our energy system now mm. um and the way that it's, it's kind of operating so we've got the opportunity to maintain those links and to use use our sort of energy system as a way of, of building bridges outside of scotland um as a result of brexit um. Sorry. Uh, a follow-up from Gillian Martin. It may be uh, one or other of you may want to come in with a bit on the last question from Gordon MacDonald as well. Gillian Martin. Thank you. So uh, Gordon's been talking about some of the, the issues that affect you um, in, in reaching your potential. And you've talked, you've, you've referenced other countries in the world, particularly Japan. Um, are, is there anything, when you look at other countries, that you see them doing that would be something that we could adopt to, to solve some of these issues that you've found about reaching your potential? So, uh, in, in the field of um, life sciences, regenerative medicine and precision medicine, um, I, I think we one, one of the real assets that we have in Scotland is, is our electronic health records and our patient data. And I think for me, that I've heard people say that that's Scotland's new oil. That appears to be the... Uh, the phrase that's used more often than not. And I think that is a fantastic asset that we have. Uh, the challenge that we have is that we are not building this from scratch. We are starting to think about how we can use our data in a very uh, productive way for patient benefit and for Scotland's economy. The, the, the challenge we face is that companies like uh, countries like Estonia or Qatar, who haven't had the, health, the national health system, have started from scratch. So they've actually been able to build a... a, a a system that works very, very well and can be interrogated and integrated quite easily. The challenge we have is that ours has grown organically, and so it's probably a bit less structured, a bit less ordered. Um, and, and for me, that's where I see the real opportunity, that Scotland has this huge wealth of data that we could use in lots of different ways for the academic community, for the clinical community, for the SME community and the pharmaceutical industry to really, really improve Scotland's health and Scotland's economy. And how do we restructure that in a way that it's easily accessible and, more importantly, ethically um, 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 available? So I, I think when you look at countries like Finland and you look at countries like Estonia, they have managed to build really helpful infrastructure purely and simply because they're starting from scratch. And I think that makes a big, big difference when you're trying to kind of morph something into something different when you already have a huge legacy of data um, existing. And, and, and with respect to the R&D and, and the um, collaboration side of things, I think for me the challenge is that our universities here in Scotland, we have world-leading universities, and what we really want is to, to make sure that the best and the brightest people come to work in Scotland, come to do their research here. At Glasgow, we were fortunate enough to uh, encourage Professor Andrew Biankin to come from Sydney to work um, in Wolfson Wall up at the Gas Cube Estate. He works on pancreatic cancer, a huge unmet medical need in that disease. He, uh, we worked with him on a project. He's managed to attract £10 million of CRUK funding into his lab. He's now doing precision medicine clinical trials on pancreatic cancer a fantastic achievement for Scotland. Um, we need more of those people to come to Scotland and to do that groundbreaking research here. But it's not just the big professors, the big heavy hitters, it's the research students, it's the graduate students, people wanting to do PhDs and postdocs here. We need to make sure that we have an environment that encourages them to come and to work in Scotland. 
And then we have an opportunity for us as an innovation centre to collaborate with some of the best and the brightest people um, in the university sector to work with people like David. So we should be reducing the barriers to entry for them to get into precision medicine projects. People in Scotland might be working in precision medicine, but they're not actually aware that that's what they're doing. And we need to find those companies and we need to work with them and collaborate with them and help them to, to achieve, to grow, to become companies of size and scale. As David says, we have this issue with companies remaining quite small and quite niche and how do we enable them to scale up so working with fantastic academics working with the innovation centers and the innovation centers being properly funded so that they can seed these projects these risky projects that the SME community just don't have um, necessarily that the funds to do so we need to be less risk averse I think so yes I think we have to be bold you know I, I think it's it's uh, the opportunity, for, it's certainly in my sector, the opportunity for us is there. We are, uh, certainly we have all of the components to be a world leader in precision medicine, but we are not the only one. You know, Finland is, I keep going on about Finland because they are comparable to us in, size, in terms of population. And they have been incredibly successful at attracting funding to do population-based sequencing studies. So 60 million euros went into Finland uh, just before Christmas to sequence 500,000 Finnish people. Uh, the Finnish Innovation Centre gave 20 million euros to that project, and they have six or seven pharmaceutical companies, including Pfizer, AstraZeneca, big blue chip companies working with them to help them um, exploit their expertise in this area. Why haven't they come to Scotland? Why aren't we doing that? We could, we, we could do that. And in the renewable sector, I'm just interested to see if there's anything around your route to market um, issue. Yeah, I mean, there's there's different different setups in different countries, but what we we do hear from members is that in some other countries, despite them being within Europe and within the same state aid structure that, that we that we sit within as well, there has been investment in infrastructure in other European countries. So things like ports and harbours, which have facilitated their competitiveness, so they've been allowed to do that. The other area um, that I think is really interesting, I had the benefit of going to Switzerland uh, in the last couple of years to see how they work on skills and their um, skill system is very different to our own in that they are very very heavily dominated by apprenticeships rather than the graduate route um, and the the links between industry and academia are very very close so industry sets the standards you know for, for vocational courses which I think um, certainly seems to power up their economy and I think that's something I know that we are seeking to change in Scotland and I think more you know a, a faster drive towards that would be a good thing I think um, in other countries as well, particularly sort of France, I think is is the key area, and you see in Canada as well. There's a lot of weight being thrown behind wave and tidal, so there is a lot um, to be gained from from driving these new technologies. And wave and tidal has been a sector that that has been sort of loomed large in the Scottish kind of landscape for obvious reasons, because we've got lots of natural resources, and we are still trying to sort of build um, an industry of scale there. We're doing very very well. Again, this is one of the areas where we've got really obvious world leading prowess in this area particularly off Orkney and that's one of the really key things about uh, the renewable sector is that it can reach parts of the economy that other industries potentially can't reach and I think it's that recognition that we could use this to, to, to create the kind of economy that we're looking for here in Scotland. Do you feel there's enough been done to um, encourage people who've maybe got transferable skills mm. in oil and gas, for example, to move over to renewables? Yeah, I, I think that's an absolutely critical point and I'm, I'm really glad that you've touched on it. Um, you know, it, it would be... It would be very good for us to work with the enterprise agencies to, to make sure that we make the best use of those skills that we do already have here in Scotland, because there are a lot of transferable skills, particularly <laughs> between oil and gas, um, floating offshore wind and wave and tidal, and to be able to capitalise on what we already have would, would, be, would really help in terms of competitive advantage and help us work on that cost reduction cycle that we're currently looking at. Thank you. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, up to now, we've looked mainly at sectors, and I was just wondering if you could give us examples within your sectors as to companies that have maybe done better, or <laughs> conversely, companies that have done worse. Uh, and, and, you know, what is it about these companies? Except, Dr. Bunton, you are a particular company, so I don't know if that makes it more difficult for you or whatever. Um, but just, or, or, I mean, if you, if you want to tell me that everybody in the sector is doing equally well, uh, I'm listening to that as well. So. Dr. Bunton. I, th I think there are... 
there are certain companies that have done extremely well in Scotland and have, have led the way in, in global terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, BioOutsource is a very rapidly growing pharmaceutical services company. Um, and there are, interestingly, there are three or four other companies, Vitrology, BioReliance, um, all in that similar area of testing the, the safety of manufactured uh, pharmaceuticals. And so Scotland's built up a reputation. It's known for the quality of the work, the, the, the assurance that the customers have of, of, of having a, a very um, highly regulated and very carefully delivered approach and good customer service. And so all these uh, sort of softer elements, if you like, have, have played a big part in re the reputation of that whole sector. So were they just lucky in choosing that no, sector? No, absolutely not. I think that there's been some very good science that's underpinned that, which originally has the, the come out and, uh, from universities and has underpinned the regulatory development. So the, the science has led the way as to what sort of regulations should be used to test the safety of certain uh, manufactured products. And then what's been really successful is very, very good business skills and commercialization around that from companies like BioReliance and Q1 Biotech built up that area and now other companies and some of those same people have gone recycled back into those new businesses mm -hmm. and scaled those businesses again, done it again. So the skills and the universities you've mentioned, the two which I guess are linked, uh, so would you say that was a key, that a, su key, a successful company is going to have a very close link with the university? I would say that's key as a starting point, but what's really, the, the scale I think that's been achieved is the commercial skills and that's, is, is I think something we want to see in other clusters is, is there's maybe not enough of a focus on uh, in developing our, our scientists to have not only good science, but good commercial skills. And so there, there are not that many of those really focused commercial uh, business people around. And per perhaps our reticence in Scotland to see sales and business development as a, as a vocation and a real career. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something that I think these companies have have excelled in, and they've sold Scotland as a place of excellence, and that's, you know, that's why they've gone on to em employ uh, hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in in Europe, they're doing around forty percent of the biopharmaceutical testing. So I think it's it's the science from the universities for sure, but also having the right business and commercial skills to to grow that mm -hmm. and to build around that. Is that your view, Dr. Yes, Harrison? I, I would agree with, with David. I think uh, Scotland's um, CRO and pharma services uh, industry is, is world-renowned. Um, when I worked at Pfizer, we worked with many of the companies who are based here in Scotland, so it, it's definitely uh, an area of strength for us. I think, for me, there are other areas where we need to think about really exciting areas of, of, of research and therapeutics and looking at, at new medicines. So we have a lot of very interesting SMEs who are, who are coming up who are working on um, particular diseases, Caldan working in fibrosis, Mirroned working in inflammation. But these are very small companies. Then how do we grow them to become companies of size and scale? What kind of investment can we give them to enable them to grow? We've had some um, successes. There was IMET Pharma who was acquired by Merck. Uh, Nukana, who work in uh, oncology, were, uh, had one of the largest IPOs. So we do have successes in this area, but they're few and far between. And what's been their secret? <sighs> a fantastic... Uh, uh, well, for IMET Pharma, they were working in a very hot area of, of science. They're working in immuno-oncology, which all of the pharmaceutical industry is very keen to get products that are, are interesting in that field. So they were in the right place at the right time with a company who needed, uh, who maybe needed to acquire some assets. Um, Nukana have a very interesting um, way of, of, of treating cancer, and I think they just had a compelling story and the belief that, that, that it was the right way to go. But I think for, for other companies, getting that next level of investment is really, really critical. It's how do we grow these companies to become uh, companies of size and scale. And I think that's, that, for me, is the challenge. And will um, that normally be selling to a Japanese or Chinese or American company? Not necessarily. I mean, certainly that's that's the case that's happened with, with, um, with Merck and, um, and IMET but, and, and David and, and Repressel. But I, I think... In other cases, what happens is that the idea starts in Scotland and goes to America and is commercialised. I think that is another thing that also happens. Um, 
it is really important that we have this recycling of skills through through our ecosystem and I think as David said that doesn't happen as as, as much as it should do we still have this fear of failure that, that to fail is a bad thing in America that's not seen to be a bad thing if you go and do a startup and your startup fails you start the next one you know it isn't it isn't hung around your neck like a millstone you learn from what happened before and, and you don't do it again it's it's how do you build on on those failures um, my okay. background is in business development, so I would agree with David. The, the ability to go out and to commercialise early stage research or research from SMEs is vitally important. And people who have um, an understanding of the science and a business acumen to go out and commercialise those opportunities is something that I think is lacking as well. And it's okay. hugely, hugely important. That's great. Thanks very much. I mean, Ms. Mack, is that, is that an issue in your side as well? Yeah. Do the people with the science have good commercial skills? Um, I think what's been good for our industry has been the um, that revenue stabilisation mechanism and the subsidy system that we talked about, because that's created a really strong environment for, for further private investment. So I think that's the thing first and foremost. I think I have to agree with the point um, that Diane was making around about fear of failure. One of our industries where we are seeing two really world leading companies um, in, in the, the tidal sector. So we've got Maygen and Scott Renewables, who've both, you know, have come through that process of, of innovation, failure, learning from those mistakes and going forward. And part of the kind of plan to move forward with that marine sector is around being able to enhance and accelerate all of that learning and use that to kind of drive cost reductions. Um, I think one, two of the key factors that really have supported um, different different technologies within within my industry is their ability to to be innovative, to, to take on innovation, but also to be international and to think about international markets. What what we are solving here in Scotland in terms of renewables is a global issue. It's around about combating climate change and being open to being able to, to reach out to those international markets and diversify. So, if I think about just two other companies, um, we've got Windhoist who are, who are based in Ayrshire, who have who have operations in every pretty much every European country and two in Africa. You know their ambition is not constrained by being here. They're very much open. Um, to and is that just here. up to the individual company and the individuals, or can we as the public sector or Scottish enterprise do anything to help that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, we've seen strong support from both Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise uh, here as renewables was obviously identified as a growth sector. And I think we've taken the right approach um, to this given our really abundant natural resources. You know, we've got 25% of Europe's wind power, 25% of the tidal resource, 10% of the, of the wave resource. Um, there is a debate ongoing, as I said, around about with the members around about investments that happen in other countries around supporting infrastructure, which I think potentially could be helpful. Like say, sort of ports and harbours and that kind of thing and we're really keen to work with the agencies to try and smooth out some of the some of the work for the supply chain because we do share the supply chain in a number of areas with oil and gas and being able to, to do a bit of supply chain planning I think would stand us in pretty good stead. Okay thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you Andy Whiteman. Thank you very much convener we've heard quite a lot about automation in recent um, years or so there's mixed messages around it uh, I was just wondering what your view is it on it is it something that can be harnessed to improve Scotland's economic performance, or is it something that um, poses challenges? I think um, for us, I mean, this, I'll go first because you guys will probably have quite a lot more to say about automation and change. We're we're a relatively modern industry um, in renewables, and we, we've been relatively well penetrated in terms of automation, in terms of our sort of system type stuff. And um, by that, I mean just being able to. Um, change the, the optimisation of wind farms and that kind of stuff and that's the really exciting things that are happening you know, within Scotland right now and, and I had the pleasure of going down um, to, to Castle Douglas to see uh, Natural Power's new smart um, operations centre down there which is all about trying to, to optimise yield from wind farms trying to make sure that we get the best kind of designs in there so that kind of automation is, is, is ever present in our industry so wind farms are operated from a distance and have been for quite some time There's there's lots of great productivity gains that we can get from being a bit smarter in there, just around about how we get people on and off sites, um, being able to, to check people's work tickets and that kind of thing um, against databases rather than having to do it by paper when we get in there. So that kind of thing uh, is really, really exciting. We are in the renewable sector more of the disruptive force than the disrupted, um, I think. So we don't face the same issues, I think, in terms of... Um, 
changing changing out technology and people. It's not quite the same. Where it will really impact in the energy sector is actually more at the consumer end, which is where we have to, again, like I say, in Scotland, we've got quite a really good opportunity here to be very, very good at new smart energy networks, new localised energy networks. People take a much more active interest in their energy use and energy efficiency um, by being able to use the data that we can present to consumers, allowing them to make to make good choices and to allow us to make choices about where and how we generate energy in the future. I think in the high high value manufacturing area, in, uh, which is another key sector of life sciences uh, in, in Scotland, with, with GSK has been long standing major employer here, and also startups and spin-outs that have taken um, manufacturing processes into, into the market. That's, there's certainly opportunities to uh, automate and, and, and lead the way. I, I think also in areas like digital health, uh, that we're seeing increasing automation. Um, however, that's not only about the um, actual laboratory processes that may be involved in these sorts of areas, um, I know Diane will, will comment more in the pre precision medicine area, but we've certainly seen um, some of the more routine laboratory tests become commodities and where um, we can really stand apart from the, the rest of the market is the application of the um, analysis of the data, the, um, the, the utilisation of that to re make a real impact on patient health and for uh, adding value to companies. So I, I think it will be a combination, really, of the, the, the automation processes and the, the value add that comes back to, I think it comes back to our uh, talent pool in the country and making sure that we have that, that link between those, those two elements. And as, as David said, life sciences has, has long been uh, familiar with automa automation. Uh, for many of the companies that we've talked about earlier with pharmaceutical services, using robotics to do high throughput screens so that you can screen millions of compounds very quickly and very efficiently it has been done for years within the industry. So that, that's nothing new uh, in life sciences. I think where the interesting opportunity is, is around AI and data. As I've said, we have a huge amount of data here, and to actually mine that data and find interesting um, things that could impact patients' health, having using AI on that data, for me, is a real opportunity, and there's lots of companies that are springing up who are looking at the possibilities of, of using that. And actually, that's across all data, not just health data, um, where I think there could be some real groundbreaking, innovative things that come out of, of using those two technologies together. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Can I start by showing a little bit of ignorance here? Dr. Harbison referred to the term Kai. Now, where I come from, that's a cow, and I'm suspecting, <laughs> I'm suspecting it's not the case here. Could you perhaps just... It's the community index number. It's the number that you get uh, when children are born in Scotland. Anyone who touches the health centre has a Kai number. So uh, when you go to your doctor all your prescription data, any imaging data, any blood work is all associated with this particular number, which is hugely powerful. Thank you for that. Um, Scotland's economic strategy identifies six designated uh, sectors, food and drink, tourism, life sciences, financial and business services, creative industries and energy. From your perspective, what benefit does actually having these designated growth areas with the policy behind it what, what, is, what does that benefit you by? I, I think it's the joined up nature of support that's going to bring that long term commitment for, for some of these sectors. Coming back you know, to points about the, the, the time required to actually see the economic benefits of precision medicine, regenerative medicine, um, some of the areas that we're now expert in, I mentioned the pharmaceutical services companies that are now off scale. That's taken a long time for that to come from the, you know, the science. Some of those, those breakthroughs in science were in the 80s or 90s and are now you're creating hundreds of, of jobs. So I think having it as a, um, as a sector, identified as a sector, which allows us to pick out the main um, areas of importance. So in, in life sciences, it's the, it's the infrastructure it's the, um, you know, the, the talent pool, it's having the right regulatory environment, which I think is another 
point related to Brexit that we must must protect that, and we have a very strong regulatory environment, um, and it's investment. So we we know that if we get those things right, that we can really uh, scale up uh, companies. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think um, being part of a sector means that we can coordinate our activities, focus on the areas where we truly have world-leading expertise, and, and think about how best to coordinate all those activities. So how can we in, in, encourage more investment into Scotland from VCs or from, from companies looking to acquire interesting and innovative technologies? So I think being part of that and having that coordinated approach to a particular problem is, is a good one. I think for us in renewables, it's, it's largely similar. So that's um, signalled a level of ambition here in Scotland, which is, is, is very helpful to us in terms of bringing in international collaborative partners, in terms of bringing in investment, and in terms of bringing visibility to us, because we were monitoring and measuring all of these sectors and are able to, to, to take our place on um, what, what generally is a global stage uh, as well for renewables, to be able to, to, be able to, to lay claim to what we've actually achieved here in Scotland. So it does that has that coordinating approach? I mean, the word coming through very strongly here is coordination. Mm -hmm. Is that done within the sector itself, or is it by the government, or is it a partnership? How does it actually function? Mm -hmm. well, we are obviously the trade body for renewables, so we do an element of that coordination because we sit across all of our sectors, so are able to kind of um, quite easily identify where the strengths and weaknesses are and where where the kind of the linkages are between them. I think for us. Um, the key linkage is that we sit very much between UK government policy and Scottish government policy. So, um, as like I said, the revenue stabilisation mechanism is a UK government policy um, piece, whereas our actual deployment and delivery is very much governed right here in Scotland um, through the planning and consenting process. And being able, that coordination is absolutely critical for us, and, and that's an area that we continually focus on to try and make sure that we get that right so that we can create the best environment to, to have a renewable business here in Scotland. And the coordination manifests itself in similar ways across all the sectors? I think it has to be in partnership. I think if it's all government-led, it, it may be the wrong uh, direction that's selected in terms of that market feedback. So it has to be a combination of the, the um, investment the infrastructure and the supporting environment uh, from things like the Scottish Investment Bank, the export assistance from SDI, these are important government interventions, if you like, to support the economy, but the, the companies are providing that uh, barometer of where the markets are going and where the future opportunities are coming from. So the partnerships have to, have to be right there, and I, I think the other, the other than that, the strengths of the universities and the NHS are, are great, they're not, but they're not perfect. You know, we shouldn't kid ourselves that everything is, is absolutely perfect there. I, I think the NHS is a unique uh, uh, structure that we can we can work in partnership with for economic benefit and pa patient health, most importantly. But there are still ways that we can improve that. Um, things like the health and in health innovation partnerships have addressed, tried to address that problem that some companies may have found it quite difficult to engage with the NHS as um, as customers. So um, I, I think we need to go further in still working together in, in <coughs> partnership. But in my view, it has to be the industry base. If we're talking about economic performance, it's the industry base that's, that's sensitive to the changes in the, uh, what, what their customers want and where the market is going, and that they can help uh, work with the government, with the universities and the NHS to try and uh, direct strategy. So would you say the balance of the partnership is about right between the government and the, and the different sectors at this time? I think Scotland really has led the way with things like inve the Scottish Investment Bank. You know, so that's we've been ahead of the, the game there, and it's very important we keep that up, and that for early R&D funding, that we, we make sure that we, uh, we, we don't fall behind with uh, after Brexit, because they're, you know, it's very important for that early uh, investment. Um, but you know, I, I, th I think the balance between NHS and companies is something that's improved a lot, but st it's still not perfect. Get, just to take a slightly different angle, do you think com companies within your own sectors are confident enough and supported enough to sell more goods 
both to the internal market and, importantly, to the international market? Are, are, are they at a position that they have that confidence to get out there and expand? I think so. I think so. the support that we get from organisations like SDI uh, to go to meetings like uh, for us, and I'm sure for David and other um, SMEs in the Scottish uh, ecosystem, going to conferences that are essentially partnering meetings. So it's almost like speed dating with a potential um, customer. You go in and you have you go to Boston, you go to San Diego, you go to areas of, of, of um, life sciences expertise anywhere in the world. And SDI can help you facilitate those meetings. They very often have office space in those cities where you can take space, hot desk, and have those meetings that, that can enable you to meet um, potential new customers. So I think the work that SDI do in that respect is very, very helpful. Um, I, oh, sorry, yes, I was just going to say we've now been joined by Gareth Wynne. I wondered if you had any comment on that. Uh, yes, and, and firstly, I'm really sorry to have been so late. Clearly, um, big confusion on the, on the timing start for me, so uh, apologies for that. But just to, to your question, I think for the oil and gas sector, um, th there is a, the home market and the export market are, are linked. Um, in order, in order to create a really strong platform for exports, and we already export something like £12 billion pounds a year of, of, of goods and services from our industry overseas. Um, but in order to have that, you need the strong base here to develop the expertise and the know-how um, to be able to export it to other parts of the world where it might be useful. And there are some other um, offshore um, uh, basins in, in, in Brazil, in Indonesia, um, and, so, and, and others where the skills that are, that are right here in, in Scotland are very exportable. And it's a key part of the sector deal, in fact, that we've that we've uh, just proposed to the UK government that um, to, to enable us to build on that and to create some centres of excellence uh, based here in Scotland um, to help us to develop that a bit further. Just, just, a, just a final question there. Do the companies within your sectors consider boosting exports to be important, or is it a secondary consideration to, you know, expanding the company dom domestically? Okay, so in the renewable sector, one of the key constraints around export, if you will, or putting putting electrons somewhere else, is um, is around grid and about modernising our grid and being able to get the correct kind of interconnectors that we need in order to to be able to export some of our, our resource. Um, we, you know, everybody's well versed in what happens quite often in the wind industry, which is that that wind is constrained by the fact that the grid can't cope. With, with what it has, you know, what it can generate, and, and that's a really key issue for us. I mean, there are there are a lot of programs and projects going on through off-chain and national grid in order to modernise that, um, but there are also other options that we can think about around about the islands in particular and, and what their capacity could be to in order to export northwards. So, uh, a sim similar story, I think, for for uh, my sector, which is that. Um, there are two two dimensions in which the in which we can secure a, a longer term future for the companies that are operating currently only or mainly in oil and gas. The first is diversification into other energy sources, and in that respect, um, our sectors overlap. And the other and the other is uh, is geographies. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a big I think it's a big part in particular for the companies operating the supply chain uh, within the oil and gas. Right, thank you. I'd like to move on now to questions from Kezia Dugdale, um, just conscious of our time at the minute. Thanks, Convener. Uh, just listening to the remarks you've made already this morning, we've heard references to the need to um, maintain high standards of re regulatory regimes across Europe. You've talked about the importance of free, move free movement of labour across Europe. You've talked about the importance of tariff uh, and barrier-free access to Europe. Uh, and um, you're also just generally the, the importance of collaboration across the nations. Can you just spell out to us in the clearest terms you can how big a deal Brexit is and the consequences of either staying or leaving the single market within leaving the European Union? So I, I think for me, because uh, the area that we work in is global, um, actually I think the impacts of, of Brexit will possibly <laughs> be slightly less with, with us than for other, for other industries because... Um, pharmaceutical companies will go and work with the best people, irrespective of where they are in the world. Um, I think, as, as David has highlighted, some of the concerns about the regulatory approval system and what the impact of that might be, um, the impact of recruiting the right talent. We've talked earlier on about 
really exciting and innovative research being done in the universities because people have come here. Um, and I think that is a concern, that if we can't attract the right talent here, particularly if you think about areas where there's a great um, lack of skills, and IT in particular is one of the areas, so there is a real lack of data scientists, of um, bioinformaticians, and we are doing a lot within the innovation centres, the data lab in particular, to make sure that we have the skills to, uh, to work in this space. But not being able to attract those people to Scotland would be a, would be an issue. A, a, little, a little bit the same. A little bit the same for um, for oil and gas. Um, the, the 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 issue for us is is not so much in or out of the customs union, but the customs processes. Um, so particularly if you're if you if I paint a picture for you, imagine a um, a platform in in the North Sea that has a critical pump that fails for whatever reason. At the moment, um, I, uh, there's at least one of our operators that uh, relies on pumps being manufactured in Italy. And, they, and, and if, if that were to break, uh, they, will ship the, they will ship that uh, pump uh, post-haste from Italy directly. Um, now, if that, if that process is quick and smooth, um, then, then, that's, then actually the tariffs is not such an issue as the, as the as the uh, as the customs barriers, it's not to say the tariffs don't matter. Of course, they do in a, in an industry that's that's fought so hard to bring its costs down since the downturn of 2014. Any additional cost would be it would be an issue. And there, in 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 a, you know, if if we ended up with um, a World Trade Organization terms, in effect, the cost of operating our industry would more or less double uh, if we were on World Trade Organization. Uh, terms. Now, obviously, that's a worst-case scenario, so hopefully it won't come to that, but that gives you an idea of the scale of it. I think ours is very, very similar in that, yes, uh, the impacts are probably slightly less in renewables than elsewhere, but the drive in renewables is, is all around cost reduction as well, very similar to my colleague in oil and gas, so anything that would, that would impact that process. The, the landscape is changing. The whole of the energy system is facing kind of increased pressures on costs across all elements um, of, the, of projects, so we need to ensure that Scotland is, is the best place and the most competitive place to establish a renewable energy project, and that, that would be our key aim. Thank you. And you mentioned there in your answer uh, skills. If I can invite you just to consider um, the role of enterprise and uh, skills agencies in the work that we're doing just now and ask you to comment mm -hmm. on whether you consider the landscape to be cluttered and, and how you would um, sort of evaluate the quality of the advice and support that you may or may not have received. I am, um, in terms of skills, um, very interested in all of the work that's been happening around the enterprise and skills review to kind of change uh, change the skill set. I've already mentioned um, my experience in Switzerland around about apprenticeships, and we're already kind of uh, moving down that road. I think what we would would very much welcome is working more tightly around those more place based economic development plans, because that's very much where renewables can really come into its own. And we've seen this um, certainly in the last couple of years as um, remote islands wind has developed. You know, it's obviously going to have have because of its grids and connection charges a much higher kind of cost of energy but it does have other aspects to it on the socio-economic front that which, which will drive some very very strong positive outcomes for areas of Scotland that wouldn't ordinarily be attractive to, to other broader industry groups so that's where we're very keen to work with the, with the enterprise agencies on that and as we said earlier about looking at transferring skills in from oil and gas and smoothing that supply chain and um, for both of our industries too. Yeah I'd, I'd, I'd uh, in, I agree with most with, with with most of that as well, um, and I think from our point of view, we've got around 300,000 people working directly in the industry across the UK, and more or less half of those are are in Scotland. Um, the big challenge for us is how to make sure, as with most um, uh, technical industries, um, how we get more more well qualified engineers, people with a with a technical competency coming through, whether it be at apprentices or graduates level, to replace some of the aging workforce that are that are starting to reach the end of their working life so that i think there's a, anything we can do on that front is a good thing are we doing anything on that because my well, question is about the quality of the support that you're receiving yeah yes there, there, there's a lot of good support out there but there but there I th there's one particular issue that i think we, you could possibly help us with uh, which is the the way in which the apprenticeship levy is uh, is rolled out at least from an oil and gas point of view because here here in here in scotland the the institutions that are uh, that, that effectively provide the the, the training that qualifies um, are not the ones that are most useful to our members, 
Um, so, so for that, so for that reason, they're, they're, they're not. They're, our members are telling us they're not unhappy with paying the levy, but they are a bit unhappy about the fact that some of the um, places that they would like to take their trainees from are not uh, don't qualify, and therefore they can't draw down effectively on the benefits of the levy in Scotland, at least. I think in terms of skills development in life sciences that we are having set up a US subsidiary, we found it um, much easier to recruit here and to get good scientists. And part of that's the combination of the academic and the practical skills. Um, I've seen a couple of concerning statements from graduates that we've been recruiting about the extent of the practical skills being replaced by simulation, computer simulation and so on. So I, it's just a note of concern. I don't think it's a huge worry, but just to maintain the quality that we have, you know, we are, we do punch above our weight in terms of our uh, life scientists and that, that practical element is, is really important to our undergraduates. I, I would agree with that. I think, as, as David said, we have a, a very strong um, research uh, intensive universities here which produce really skilled graduates. I think for me the concerns are around data scientists and, and informatics and making sure that we have the skills in order to, to make the most of all the, the stuff that's coming out around AI and, and other new technologies. Um, but also I think, as I said earlier, getting people who are scientists with business acumen or people who are project managers, I think for graduates to think much more widely about what they could do with a science degree, that it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be at the bench and working in a lab. Um, David and I probably both started off there, but neither of us are there now. And I think so to, to, to get graduates who come out with an ambition to do something different, they, they don't necessarily have to work in a lab. And what needs to change to make that happen? We've heard evidence in previous weeks uh, how in China there are compulsory business elements in all undergraduate degrees. Is that the type of that's, thing you're looking that's at? That's happening. I think that's, that's up to industry to also play their part in actually offering that type of training. So the uh, Skills Development Scotland have started a was a, a CV competition, it's now an apprenticeship uh, or sort of, uh, work placement competition and that's grown very rapidly and students benefit from a, a summer long work placement and get those commercial skills. So I think that's something that we need more companies to buy into. It's, you know, it's not only about intervention but about the companies offering those opportunities. And we do do that. So in, in, um, in our innovation centre and in the other innovation centres, we've had students come in to work in the summer or to work in their projects. And we've not only offered them uh, projects that are lab-based. In my, in my innovation centre, we've offered people the chance to do a business development role to see if it's something that they would enjoy doing. Um, and one of our recent graduates worked with us on a project, did very well, and went um, worked with Innovate UK. But with respect, the question was about what happens within universities before they arrive in your doorstep. So should there be more done around businesses within the state element of the system? I think, again, the, there's some elements <coughs> are being built in with training and regulatory compliance or graduate skills. There's graduate skill master classes that Caledonian University have developed. So these are s small projects that I think students have really bought into and they are, they're attending them in high numbers and they're, they're things that we could integrate more into the undergraduate programme. Yes. <coughs> All right, Jimmy Halker johnson Thanks very much. Um, a number of the issues uh, I was going to ask have been covered anyway by, uh, by other colleagues. So um, I suppose I would ask very kind of quickly, does the current education and skills structure in Scotland, do you think that will meet without, if it's not changed kind of going forward, will that meet your future needs and the needs of your sectors? question <laughs> because uh, you know we all know the stats around how many jobs don't exist yet and yeah. that kind of thing um i think we're quite lucky um we're quite well blended i think again i'll go back to experiences in switzerland because i looked across the whole sort of system so saw what happened in kind of career development and interesting just to reflect on the points that you've just made around in the graduate space what what I did, we did see we met and or went to a sort of careers day for kind of um school age children, so around 14, 15. But I was really struck by the level of confidence in there. Um, you know, these, these kids were you know, expected to write their own CV, get themselves into an interview, get through that interview, you know, and it really did give them skills at a very, very early age, which was, which was, was helpful. And I know that um, some of the, the modern apprenticeship network does allow for that to happen. The foundation apprenticeship model does allow for that to happen here. And it just felt like a, a really good way to equip their young people well for for what for the world of work. I think there is in general 
um, we need to focus um, more widely just on preparing our young people for the kind of world they're going to enter in. And that, in my industry, does mean that they will probably be working in a much more international world. I mean, we look at the oil industry and, and the sort of there's a bit of an adage that goes around that no matter where you work in oil across the world, you'll hear a Scottish accent. And that's what we want to see for renewables as well. And it's that recognition that your career will very much potentially be based around international travel. It will be based around doing international projects and working collaboratively with people. And those sort of skill sets are really, really important uh, for the future. Can I just just add, add also on the kind of the the, the, the kind of careers advice and, and mm. business engagement with with schools, with colleges, and like how early should that be happening? And are, mm. are we? Are we getting involved, or a business getting involved uh, early enough now? I, w I would say um, the, the the key moment is when people move from uh, in in Scotland towards choosing their hires. Um, that's the that's the key moment in time, uh, because that's where that's where they start to narrow down the the uh, the breadth of their education, and it sort and it begins to, if not lock in, lock out certain certain options, particularly if they, if we want them to go down a more technical route. And I w I would say I agree with a lot of what Claire was just saying on. Uh, about the foundations that are necessary, I do think we could redouble our efforts still on um, STEM subjects, and in particular, to, to because you know whether whether people want whether whether people coming through want to um, go into um, infrastructure engineering or um, oil and gas or renewables or you know that that foundation of STEM is absolutely fundamental. So I think no matter. No matter how much we're doing, we can always we can still do more, and that's uh, I think that's true here in Scotland and true across the UK. Dean Lockhart, thank you very much. I wanted to return to the question of uh, commercialisation of innovation because I think it's a, a very important part of the sort of economic business development uh, analysis. We've heard examples today and in other sessions of uh, startup companies and new technologies established either in university, colleges or business in Scotland being bought by overseas investors because overseas investors have a longer term outlook. Given that we have you know, hundreds of millions of pounds being spent by the enterprise agencies and we've got the new Scottish National Investment Bank coming on stream, what can we do to address that gap? Uh, what can we do to keep more innovation um, in Scotland and more innovation developed here to be owned by Scottish companies going forward? Is it largely a question of money being available, long-term patient capital, or are there other considerations uh, that we can look at to address this gap? Okay, um, I think there is a, a, it is the patient capital question, and, we're, and I think we're all quite kind of well versed in there. Um, I think there is a huge opportunity for, in my own industry between um, the Muted government-owned energy company and the Scottish National Investment Bank to work together. They, that, that can be a very, very powerful combination for us in terms of developing not only innovative technologies and then getting them onto the market, but being able to help in that scale-up space. There's a lot of really interesting work being done um, at the Hunter Centre at the University of Strathclyde in this space and I think um, I'm watching that um, very, very closely because I think that they are, they're doing very well in there. I think for us, um, renewables for me provides a really excellent living example of getting things from innovation into commercialisation and being able to bank that knowledge and use it across sectors. You know, that's not unique to my sector, this issue of the, the so-called valley of death or fear of heights is the other way I've heard that kind of termed is, the, is this people not being able to be too big, is being able to genuinely utilise what we already have. You know, we do have some big companies here um, who stay here and, and manage to, to, to be the big fish around uh, the place and, and being able to bring all of that knowledge much more closely together I think would really stand us in good stead. I, th I, th I think there's a whole, I think there's a, a combination of factors that really are at work here. So yes, I think I think the long-term um, incentive, political support, um, uh, national investment in things like the uh, oil and gas technology centre and some of the things that we've got that, that we put into our sector deal which are, which sort of build on that and creating centres of excellence. I think all of that's important to maintain, um, but I think beyond that, the other the other thing that's really important is just to make sure that the that Scotland remains a a good place to do business in general. So that may, uh, which which means you know the right tax regime for personal taxation, the right um, and make it a nice place to live, um, because it, I think it will make people sticky. Um, you know the we've got the in in our industry we've got a much improved fiscal environment. We've got a good regulatory environment. Um, so if we if we add if we layer in these things to, uh, for stimulus for innovation and technology development and make it uh, maintain the the attractiveness of the place a place to live and work, 
um, then I, I, th I think that's you know that combination of things is what is what will ultimately make us stand out and and stay strong. I think if we have more, more companies that are market led from the outset, and speaking also from, from personal experience, I've been a university spin out. We we probably weren't focused in the right market to start with, okay. and so that limited how much we grew initially until we actually went out and developed commercial skills uh, and, and, and looked to export. And so I think it comes back to those uh, development of good commercial business skills in the ecosystem. And uh, not, all, not all of those spin-outs and start-ups are, are going to scale. Um, so I, I think there's, there's many ways to then see the ones that are in the right market and have the biggest opportunities to grow from there. Sometimes it will be inward investment, and that doesn't mean that the company isn't anchored. I think I think the anchor point is is based around the skills of the people, the regulatory environment, the the the, the quality of work that's delivered, and that's for the pharmaceutical services. It's 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 the people, for the for the manufacturing sector. It's it's the people, and it's also the infrastructure and the inve long term investment. So I think I I think inward investment can play an important part, um, but also some of the uh, start startups and spin outs. Um, we may need to look at ways to consolidate them or select the winners earlier and, and back them further. And I know, again, that is something Scottish Investment Bank, Scottish Enterprise do, do look at and are, are considering. And as that transition happens, not only from early seed funding into other forms of funding, debt finance and, and uh, you know longer term capital. I have to say, they, again, angel investors are are pretty patient in many cases. I know that you know they, they want to be able to recycle those funds, so an, an exit is not necessarily a bad thing. It allows that investment to go back into uh, early stage companies again. And I think for many biotechnology companies uh, globally, um, acquisition is a, a, an exit strategy. Um, and I think it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think, as David said, it enables some of the capital to be recycled, but also some of the skills and experience that, to be recycled back into the community. And it is about how you make those people stick. So that if, if a, a biotech or a wee SME is bought by, by someone, how, how do you make sure that you retain the skills and the knowledge that have been generated as, as, they've, as they've grown their company? On that, just on that, on that line, which is um, an example from our industry where private equity investment into the industry um, has has in in many ways invigorated sections of, of, of it because if you buy a new asset um, uh, you, you tend to you tend to want to do something with it um, so so in, in in some ways I don't think we should worry about having outside investors coming in um, as long as long as it's on the right basis and that then it's in a properly regulated uh, way yeah. Great. Right. Thank, you. thank you very much <clears throat> we'll have to leave it there <coughs> so I'll suspend this session, uh, sorry, this, um, at this point I'll suspend the meeting. Thank you very much to all of our witnesses for coming in and uh, we'll reconvene about 10 to. Thank you very much.
<clears throat> well, good morning again, and welcome to the, the second session in our uh, economic inquiry. And uh, we have a new panel of witnesses with us for the most part. Um, first of all, Willie McLeod, Executive Director of uh, Scot um, UK Hospitality for Scotland, that is. Um, Malcolm Ruffhead, Chief Executive Officer of Visit Scotland. Ewan MacDonald Russell, Head of Policy and External Affairs, Scottish Retail Consortium. Mark Crothall, Chief Executive Officer, Scottish Tourism Alliance. And James Withers, C Chief Executive, Scotland Food and Drink Limited. Welcome to all of you. And also we have Gareth Wynne, who due to, I think, an administrative uh, mix-up had only been in part of the earlier session. So he's going to join us for this as well, but perhaps not um, involve himself in some of the questions which we've covered with him earlier. But um, uh, welcome to back to you as well. So welcome to everyone. I will uh, start with a, a fairly general question, which is uh, about the performance of the Scottish economy, how each of you have uh, seen the, or how you would view how the Scottish economy has performed over the past 10 years um, in general and also in your particular um, area uh, or sector, as it were. Um, who would like to go first? I'm happy to volunteer to you go first. You and McDonald Russell. So for the retail industry, we've got a kind of locus on this through our interest in consumers. Obviously, pretty much everybody in, shop in Scotland is a consumer of the retail industry. And as one of the largest private enterprises, we've got 240,000 workers, stores in pretty much every community, and kind of retail turnover, um, according to the most recent Scottish annual business stats, about £25 billion. Um, in terms of the performance over recent years, we track this through our own Scottish Retail Sales Monitor and also the Scottish Government produces the Retail Sales Index. They both tell pretty much the same story. Um, we saw from 1999 to 2008, year-on-year -year sales growth was about 5.9% in Scotland, um, slightly lower in the UK. There's both a definite change then. 2006, it's been 0.5%, 0.5% each year, and that's about a quarter of the UK rate. And that's been driven by you know, the kind of factors we would expect since the financial crisis. We've seen nervous consumers. We've seen a kind of downturn in economic growth. The GDP will broadly track with these sort of things in terms of consumer confidence and consumer spend. And it's also come at a time where the retail industry has gone through an enormous process of change. The last five years have altered pretty much every facet of our industry, <laughs> whether it's digital rises, as technology and automation take hold. And of course, at a time where we've seen a number of quite significant public policy interventions. So it's, it's an interesting time, uh, but uh, quite challenging as well. Thank you. And um, James Withers? Yeah, no, so from a food and drink perspective, the last uh, decade has been a success story from our point of view. Uh, back in 2007, our sector was static in growth terms. It was worth about £10 billion. Um, it had been worth roughly around that amount over the previous five years as well. Um, a new growth strategy was put in place and we've seen you know, it become Scotland's fastest growing export sector, one of the best performing domestic sectors. Um, interestingly, some of those factors that have driven that success have been out with our control. So when the exchange rates worked in our favour, food price inflation was a factor which we drove the turnover growth. Um, but there's quite a few areas in which Scotland has acted a little bit differently to other parts of the UK, in fact, the rest of the world. So if we look at just the growth of food manufacturing, the growth of food manufacturing industry in England between 2008 and 2015 was around about 13, 14%. In Scotland, it's been almost double that. So we've been growing at, at approximately twice the pace of, of, of the rest of the UK. Um, so, so real success, and there's a few reasons for that, which no doubt we'll, we'll get into later on discussion. Um, but overall, you know, we're in a growth phase, and we think that actually some of the real opportunities still lie ahead for us. And I, I should have said at the outset that don't feel each of you that you have to answer every question uh, either so and if you do want to come in just indicate by by raising your hand the the sound system will be operated independently so um willie mcleod we just make some observations really on part of the sort of hospitality and and licensed sector um clearly we're a major component of the tourism industry but we we don't just deliver services to visitors to scotland we're delivering services to uh, our resident population um, for leisure and business purposes um, uh, all the time. Um, the most recent figures we have are that uh, hospitality, the wider hospitality industry, uh, employs uh, just over 300,000 people in Scotland uh, with a GVA contributed to the economy of just over 6 billion. 
and uh, that shows quite a significant growth since we did uh, similar figures uh, back in 2010. Uh, so we, we have an industry that, that is growing, is, is fairly buoyant, um, is uh, supported very much by tourism, but also supported by uh, the, the resident population going about their daily business, looking for entertainment, uh, accommodation for short breaks, and, uh, and uh, people eating out uh, and drinking away from home. Thank you. And Gareth Wynne. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the oil and gas industry has had a, a tough time uh, in Scotland in, in the period from 2014 when the oil price collapsed, um, but, it's still tr but it still employs 150,000 people, more or less, in, in Scotland, and in 2016 and 17, um, still provided around about a bit over £200 million of contribution to, to the Scottish uh, exchequer. Um, and... Um, this year, we're, in, we're anticipating a, a, a better year. Um, so we will, we're, the, the OBR in the UK government recent just announced that around about a billion pounds of production taxes uh, in this coming year and for the next five years. And the majority of our members are now saying that they're going to um, hire more people this year. Um, so hopefully we will, we've seen the worst now of the um, reductions in, uh, in, in people. Thank you. Mark Crothall. Um, I think just on the on the tourism front, just to pick up where Willie had um, has started. Uh, yeah, we've seen really good growth over the over the, since certainly since uh, 2010, and in, certainly in the last couple of years. Um, not only in in growth of volume of visitor and, and spend, and uh, this year, in the past, in particular international spend, but in the in the growth of number of enterprises as well that started up. Uh, we're just over sort of 14,000 now, so clearly there's an appetite. Um, we launched our uh, national tourism strategy as a collaboration of industry, industry led back in 2012, and that's really stimulated a lot more uh, engagement around the tourism agenda. And uh, I think uh, our markets have changed, and there's certainly growing markets from all around the world now, which is encouraging. Thank you. And last but not least, Malcolm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think what, what we've seen over the last decade is the resilience of the tourism industry. It's come through pretty tough times, uh, not just in the UK, but globally. Uh, it's now worth £11 billion of economic activity to the Scottish economy. It makes up 5% of the Scottish GDP. Uh, and over the last decade, what we've seen is the GVA in the industry grow by 42%, uh, which again... Uh, illustrates the underlying strength of, of the, the industry. As Willie mentioned, in, in the broader visitor economy, it's about 300,000 jobs, but within tourism, it's 217,000, spread the length and breadth of, of the country. It touches every single constituency in Scotland and sustains a lot of very fragile uh, communities, particularly in the rural areas. And I think what, what we're seeing, actually, one of the great things is that the industry and the public service uh, bodies are actually working much closer together, probably at any time that I can remember over the, certainly the last decade. Thank you. And now we come to questions from Gordon MacDonald. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, what do you see are the, the key opportunities and challenges facing your sector and the Scottish economy up for the next 10 years? Mark Crothall. I think uh, a workforce is uh, probably the biggest challenge. We need a workforce to be able to service uh, the increased volume. We've got obviously a, a, an ageing population and a gap uh, as a sector across the UK. We're one that is under-resourced anyway. Um, and there are particular skills uh, in, within that sector which are probably more needed than others. Uh, chefs in particular is uh, one in great, great uh, shortage. But... Um, as we change, looking at language skills, technology skills, uh, again, are key to the sector as, the, as, as it's evolved. But workforce, without question, I think is the number one concern that comes through from the majority of how do we get more people seeing a career in tourism as a wider career of choice. And uh, there isn't this perception of it just being uh, quite narrow and something you do if you fail at school. I, I think there, there are many opportunities. You know, tourism is actually uh, one, of, one of the sectors that's growing worldwide, uh, and uh, that brings with it numerous challenges in terms of competitiveness as a destination. It means the challenges around competitiveness as, as an industry. Uh, so we have to overcome a, num a number of those particular issues. Skills in the broader sense, uh, 
uh, in terms of capacity and capabilities, so our ability to <coughs> compete on a global stage in terms of technology and the, the take up of technology within the industry is still lagging behind many other countries. But even yesterday we saw that Australia just announced a, a new $12 million uh, tourism bid fund for conferences and events. Uh, you're seeing massive investment from country, countries like New Zealand, the States, Canada. So it is a very competitive global market and we need to be able to compete. James Withers. I mean, the big opportunity we see is a growth one. So, you know, our industry is now worth 14 billion. We, we launched a new strategy last year. We believe it could be worth 30 billion by, by 2030. Uh, and that's about both growth at home. So working really close with the tourism industry to make sure our food and drink offering is, is you know, a really uh, shining light as far as Scotland's, um, you know, tourism uh, potential for visitors coming. We need more of our companies to trade across the rest of the UK, so there's much more growth opportunity there and a real transformational opportunity uh, overseas. That's built on, on two things, really, for us. Um, the growth of Scotland's brand and identity, uh, as we term it, land of food and drink. There's been a lot of work ongoing to have sectors working collectively to build that, that brand and, and that story, uh, which really resonates overseas and, and increasingly resonates at home as well. Uh, we're not going to compete on cost as far as our products go if you want cheap food, you'd be better getting that from somewhere else, but we can absolutely compete around high production standards, strong provenance story. Um, the second building block for us is the collaboration piece. Malcolm referenced you know, the close working between industry and the public sector in tourism. It's been a complete game changer for us in, in food and drink. So, you know, 10 years ago, um, I worked at National Farmers Union at the time, and we pretty much worked in, in, in a silo. We didn't talk much to our fishing counterparts. We didn't talk much to the tra trade bodies like the Whiskey Association, the Seafood Body, Red Meat Body. Um, now we work collectively to agree a single plan. Uh, and crucially for us, Scottish Government and their agencies over the last 10 years have, have swung in behind that plan. Um, there's more we need to do to deepen that collaboration, but that combination of, of working collaboratively, building on that brand, and then investing in skills, innovation, supply chain means for us we see huge growth opportunities. Brexit is absolutely a short-term hurdle we need to, we need to clear. 30% um, of our workforce are, are nationals from other EU countries. 70% of the food we sell out of Scotland goes to the European Union. Um, so, you know, that's absolutely an issue we need to tackle, but it doesn't take away from an underlying view of huge opportunity for us over the coming years. Good thing. And Gareth Wynne. Um, so, for, for, for our industry, we've got a, uh, on, a, on a 2035 time horizon, we've got a, a vision set out which is around, um, built around two strands, and, and, the, and the next 10 years is about getting us on that track properly. So, the, the two strands to it are maximising the economic recovery, so how, making sure that we make the most of and get as much of the oil and gas that's in the North Sea out uh, on a cost effective basis, and that means holding on to the cost improvements that the industry's. Um, delivered in the downturn. And then the second one, which is really important, is developing the supply chain through the, with the, to, to have more exportable, more exportable expertise, and that means helping them to improve their margins. So they've been, a lot of the supply chain have been holding on to revenue at very, at very slim margins. Um, so we need to help them to, uh, to boost that. Taken together on that 2035 time horizon, we think there's about uh, 920 billion pounds worth of additional value to be got um, if we can get it right. And Ewan MacDonald Russell followed by Willie McLeod. So probably a, a couple of things. Firstly, if our industry grows even in line with the somewhat disappointing growth of the last few years, that will be worth two and a half billion or so to the Scottish economy. It's really quite significant. I think a couple of other points. I think consumers are likely to kind of really benefit and continue to benefit and that's from technology and from the really strong competition in the industry we know that shop prices in total ex um, have fallen for the last four and a half years and that's had a huge impact on households i think the third point is that the job profile in our industry is changing the jobs are broadly becoming better and they're broadly becoming higher paid but they are becoming fewer and that kind of leads on to the kind of tech point which sits both in the opportunities and the challenges it's, it's very much double-sided that I mean technology is changing every single element of retail um, my favorite stat is 50 percent of online shopping is done on smartphones now because people are doing it literally on the move and what that means on one side is that we have opportunities to be more sustainable to be more efficient but on the flip side there'll be huge changes to the current profile of our industry we know in the last eight years that 16,000 Scottish jobs have gone we know that 1800 shops have closed 
we anticipate those trends will continue in those broad terms. We did a report last April which said a fifth of Scottish schools up to a fifth might close. Now, exactly what that is, I don't know. That's only twice the current rate. So on one side, we will see extra growth. On one side, we will see better jobs. But there are huge challenges in how that happens, particularly because those changes are likely to be quite asymmetric. Um, retail areas that are successful, that have high footfall, that are desirable, will do well. Others are likely to lose out. Thank you. Um, I, I couldn't disagree that uh, our industry, the tourism industry, has huge uh, opportunity for growth, uh, and certainly in hospitality, notwithstanding uh, the sort of well-publicised recent difficulties of some businesses in the casual dining sector, uh, I think we still see uh, massive opportunity for growth. But I think that growth has the potential to be constrained, uh, as Mark pointed out, by the labour market. Mm. Uh, we're not quite as dependent as the food and drink industry on non-UK workers. On average, in Scotland, we're about 18% non-UK, a mixture of EU and non-EEA um, employees. Uh, but it can be as high as 65%. Uh, non-UK in some city centre hotels. I and mean, to keep it in proportion, in hospitality we've got about a quarter of a million people uh, who are UK citizens employed in our industry. But if it seems likely uh, we're going to see um, free movement ending, uh, our industry is going to be in pretty serious trouble. Uh, we need, uh, we're a labour intensive industry and we will continue to need uh, people uh, to deliver services to uh, our customers who look for them um, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And we will need to uh, address uh, the, the labour market issue. Uh, and part of that is going to, uh, if free movement ends, I think we have to look uh, at UK level at uh, a fairly radical uh, view of the immigration system. Uh, the current uh, tiered system of uh, tiers one to five uh, will not work for our industry given the way it's structured. So j just taking that point forward then, um, you've talked about the immigration system, but is there any other way that uh, we can tackle the shortage of workforce that appears to be facing us in terms of, of um, tourism or food and drink sector? Or, and in particular, is how do we tackle the skill shortage that, that we're looking at? If I could lead off on that, um, I think uh, there are difficulties when uh, we have such a high level of employment mm -hmm. currently in, in the UK or a low level of unemployment. Um, the industry is uh, taking steps to, to address that. Uh, we ourselves as UK Hospitality, are uh, we've worked up a, a 10 year plan to look at how we can make our industry a lot more attractive uh, than it currently is to uh, people who, who are not necessarily looking for an academic career but are looking uh, for vocational uh, uh, opportunities. And as an industry we can offer entry level and elementary jobs which uh, allow people to move very rapidly through the, the career structure. But I think we have to become much better at demonstrating career progression, not just to the employee themselves, but to parents, to school teachers, to careers advisors and other influencers. And uh, that's something uh, the, uh, you'll be aware, I think, of the, the UK government's uh, industry strategy. And uh, the, there is an industry sector bid uh, for tourism and hospitality with the, the, the UK government at the moment. And we're awaiting a decision on that. Uh, and uh, there is a career of choice program in there that my organisation will lead on. And indeed, even if the, the industry uh, sector bid is not approved, uh, we intend to progress with that because the, there is a real constraint on our growth if we don't address labour market shortages and skill shortages. Mm -hmm. Mark Crothall. As well, he's touched on it. It sits in the tourism sector deal at UK level, but also in our um, National Tourism Skills Investment Plan, uh, which is a, an industry working group um, with Skills Development Scotland behind it. And there's a number of really good organisations, uh, Springboard and Princess Trust, um, Hit Scotland, all working together to encourage you know the youngsters to to see this as a career of choice. Perceptions of mum and dad, I think, are quite rightly so one of the ones we need to change. But I, I still feel more could be done in schools, um, particularly at primary school level, around uh, uh, the teaching working force having a better understanding of what tourism is about and the careers that exist in the in the sector. Um, it's quite narrow uh, in a lot of their thinking, and the industry will you know do where, whatever they can to go into schools and 
in this year of young people we're doing a lot of that as well um, but it's uh, you know you're fighting against many other um, sectors as well so uh, perceptions of it being a poor career of choice in terms of poor pay uh, and not being really aware of what Willie has highlighted around the opportunity to really accelerate quite quickly through into very diverse jobs well-paid jobs um, which can also take you around the world as well um, is something that's not necessarily known uh, or understood. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would echo much of what's been said. I, I do think on the skills issue, much of the responsibility to increase attraction in the sector sits with industry. And I think certainly in our sector, I think we've maybe neglected that issue more than, more than we should have done. And we're going to have to step up a bit more, whether that's companies engaging with uh, schools, whether it's about taking on internships. I do think the foundation apprenticeship model that Skills Development Scotland have um creative looks quite innovative and looks quite interesting um, and you know from our sector perspective we're now looking to make sure that you know we blow well past the target that, that skills development Scotland have for the number of places they want to to fund in our in our sector through foundation apprenticeships this year one of the issues that, that we're looking at is I mean 10 years ago we would have said there wasn't enough connection between food and drink and the education system curriculum actually I don't think that is fair now and I've got you know a uh, a son in primary school and a daughter in high school and they'll do more food education in two weeks than I probably did in 13 years when I was at school so I think things are changing but there is a bit of how we connect different initiatives one of the things that I think Scotland can be very good at sometimes is doing an awful lot of things with very laudable reasons but they can be a bit uh, disparate so there are projects already that engage with primary schools that engage with secondary schools that engage with the college network um, but they're not as well joined up as it could be um, I can barely drive anywhere in my car without hearing a recruitment advert for the armed forces, for example. There's probably a lot of investment going into recruitment, awareness raising in food and drink, but it's just not as well connected up. So, and that, again, that's a job I think we have to do with industry alongside public sector. Okay. In terms of, uh, probably my last question is, in terms of boosting productivity within your sector, there obviously has to be a lot of investment, and we've seen, particularly in retail, the growth of digital uh, technology, internet sales, etc. But is a, a not is your sector um, in general, whether it's tourism, food and drink, or oil and gas, is there enough investment into uh, new technology uh, happening in your sector, whether it to improve sales or whatever? Yeah, productivity has been a real issue for, for our sector. You know, food and drink productivity figures look fantastic because we have the whiskey industry in there. You strip whiskey out of it and it's a, yeah. it's a more mixed picture. Um, and actually, you know, the level of R&D investment in our sector was lagging behind the average of, of the Scottish economy. It's now increased and food productivity is actually up 71%. Um, food manufacturing productivity up 71% since 2007. But there's much more to be done there. I, I think the, the whole industry 4.0 jargon, but that whole next phase of artificial intelligence, augmented reality, big data, robotics, there's a huge amount to be done there. One thing would be interesting looking at with the Institute of Advanced Manufacturing or the, the Scottish Government investment there, how can we tap into that. I think we've got a you know, phenomenal track record in innovation in Scotland um, but actually if you, historically it's changing now. Historically over time a lot of the real innovation in food and drink has, been, has happened because we've had international companies come into Scotland and invest here whereas I think there's much more we can do to tap into particularly our world class uh, research base. Okay. All right, we'll perhaps move on. You may be able to come back and cover those points in the, some of them in the, in the next question. Um, John Mason. Hey, uh, thanks, convener. Um, I realise there's quite a lot in the panel. So um, we've so far looked at, I mean, we've mainly talked about whole sectors like food and drink and things. I was wondering if you could give a, each give us an example, just one example of um, a, you know, a success story within your sector, either an individual business or it could be a kind of subsector, I suppose. Uh, and a lesson, you know, can we learn a lesson from that? Either the rest of the sector can learn or um, we as the public sector could learn from. You and McDonald Russell. Definitely not going to pull out an individual member because I won't make it back to the next meeting yes, in one piece. Um, but <laughs> probably I think the biggest one is the way that we've seen multi channel retailing develop. And I think that's a huge example of where we've had quite a lot of quite high street stores who, you know, saw the kind of digital revolution coming and rather than kind of hide away or not, have completely revisited their model. And if you look at two or three of the kind of high street changes, the way that they integrate their website, the way they integrate the store, and they link the two between the two. So you can bring products back into a store or you can collect certain things. There's one particular 
particular one, obviously, who has a couple have food businesses as well, and they will link up their high street and food businesses in the same manner. And that way of trying to build the synergy so the consumer can get things at every point, that's massively efficient. That's actually been quite effective. At, you know, when we talk about the kind of online versus non-online world, it's the multi-channel bit's the really, really interesting element that's really challenged that. And it, I think that's a, a tremendous success. Of, but it does take all the things we spoke about. You need to put a really significant investment in tech. You need to change job profiles. You need to train people. It's expensive to do well, but it's been really successful in some environments. Can small retailers copy from that, or is that purely for big retailers? So I think that the kind of full multi-channel, it absolutely works on a smaller scale, particularly in quite specialised areas. If you manufacture or, or develop a certain type of product, a range of products, um, you, if you've got good transport links, you've got good broadband connection, and you know people are willing to kind of do that, it'll work well. Easier probably for smaller businesses to do the kind of pure online as well as a kind of store model, but it still applies. Um, so in, uh, in in our in our sector, I'm probably also not allowed to name a name, but um, but it, the, I think the the big success has been the, has been the reduction in costs, which which has allowed us to to get uh, more oil out and and to be sustainable at the much at a much lower oil price. And a significant component of that success as a result of the new players coming into the market and collaboration with the supply chain. So so whereas in a, in the old world. Um, you might have had a, a, an, an operator um, effectively letting a contract, and it, and it was all and it was all done um, on, on a on a you know, master master and servant basis, if you like. But uh, now now increasingly, and the way forward is going to be in um, in collaborating to find the best ways to deploy the new the new technology. So and the, and a lot of the big players in the North Sea now are names that a few years ago you probably never heard of. Uh, and has that been patchy, or has, the, has, has all companies learnt that lesson? It, I mean, it started off patchy, but I think it, but I think it's becoming the norm, um, and it, so it's becoming the way things are done. And I think there is a there is a broad recognition within our members now of the fact that this that this has been a good thing. It's helped them, it's helped the industry address the very significant challenge it's faced over the last few years, um, and I think it's given them the appetite to do more. Um, and so, I, so I think you will, I think we will see more and more of it, and not not. Not least because some of the new players are private equity investors into it, who 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 need who actually need the supply chain. They outsource a lot of the operation of the rigs and the service and and the uh, and and the production to service companies, and and that re that relies on them collaborating properly to to do the job right. Thank you, Mr. Crothall. <clears throat> Same and rather than name an individual business, I'd look at a destination. I mean, the word of collaboration has come up, and I, I take Argyle in particular, the Argyles and Isles Tourism Cooperative, where, you know, around a, a national strategy, they've created their own, and through the sort of working together piece and leadership and uh, some investment and support from Highlands and Islands Int Enterprise into the project managers in the area, the destination has really punched above its weight. And they've got, you know, tourism embedded, some great marketing plans. And, and a real sense of where, even where there's challenge around, maybe some of technology and and, and, um, <coughs> and connectivity, they are still, uh, you know, delivering a much higher quality product, uh, and there is a, a sense of of real ownership, um, and that is a certainly, you know, is a standout uh, as part so, of it. So, who's made that happen? Is that, is that the council? Is it HIE? Uh, it's it, is it's it? a collaboration of everything. I mean, it comes back to what Malcolm was saying earlier. I mean, I think you know we are in a place where never before have we got the partnerships between the agencies and the industry. But uh, you know, it it does come down to having some very strong uh, volunteers uh, of individual leaders at, it, at destination level in it, from industry who are prepared to give up their time voluntarily and lead something. But knowing that they've got the support and the partnership approach uh, with with the agencies, and you know, they're they're happy to take that on and do it. But there comes a point where there is only so much time available to those individuals. But equally, there's also a pipeline that needs to come through. Where's the next sort of leadership group? And we're seeing the same evolve in the Outer Hebrides. We've got, obviously, um, great work being done. Okay, I think I'd, I'd better for time, I'd just keep it I'll stick to one. Argyle as the, as the standout. That's great, thanks. Okay. Mr. Um, I, think, I think cross tourism uh, is probably not uh, quite as well known, but um, it actually is a, at the cutting edge of technology, uh, certainly over, over the last sort of 10, 15 years. Uh, and what that does is, is it generates a whole lot of benefits for small businesses as well as for, for larger businesses. It generates data, which means that you can, you can use that data to, 
to get an evidence-based decision making, which means that you, you increase your, the return on your investment. It also means that in terms of infrastructure development, we can look at uh, overlaying supply and demand so that we make strategic decisions in terms of where you want to, to place uh, public resources. Uh, in terms of, uh, it was mentioned in your previous session about artificial intelligence, that allows us also to make sure that information is pushed through to, to users uh, at their point of need so that they get the information that they want at any point in time. It also allows you to reduce um, distressed inventory if, if you're uh, a player on that and there's no reason why small businesses can't actually have a shop window to the world if they embrace the technology and learn how to, how to use it. I mean, we heard before that some accommodation providers are not, you can't book online with them mm -hmm. and that was a disappointment. Is that something that's changing, or is, it is, but slowly. Is it mixed? Yeah, yes. it, it's a it's a slow process. Um, when we embarked on, on the uh, the joint activity around sort of increasing capability and capacity about three years ago, the figure was sitting at about thirty six percent of businesses would uh, transact online. That figure now is just under fifty percent. So there's been pretty good growth, but there's a long way to go. And, and if you even just if you take the Visit Scotland referrals to small businesses, what we do is we take the number of referrals, we look at the average transactional uh, value for, for a booking and the number of nights, and it comes to a £700 million opportunity for businesses. Now, over 50% of small businesses are cutting themselves out of that. Okay, thank you. Mr Willers? Um, I suppose one of the success stories we would point to um, would be exports. So where that, that principle of collaborative working is actually translated into a change in how we operate and how we work. So when we look at uh, other small countries that we compare ourselves to that are successful in food and drink exports, the likes of the Irish and New Zealand, one thing they had which we didn't have was dedicated food and drink expertise on the ground in key international markets. Um, we didn't have that. The SDI network is phenomenal and they do a phenomenal job, um, but historically they've been a team of generalists. They had to be experts in food and drink and oil and gas and tourism and life sciences, financial services, which is a, a pretty tough ask. We wanted food and drink dedicated specialists, so we brought the industry together, we sat down, we were pretty ruthless in prioritising key markets. Uh, and we put funding together. So industry put money on the table. Um, that was matched by SDI. Scottish government ministers put money in. Uh, and we recruited a team of, of, of now 11 uh, people who are in 11 cities around the world opening up. I mean, we also get the, the suggestion that exporting is patchy. That, um, and I mean, some of us actually from this committee went to mention a name, Loch Lomond Brewery, who yeah. I think are very driven by exports. But I don't think every microbrewery or every small brewery is driven by exports. So are there, is there a lesson in there somewhere? Because... You're making some kind of general points, but what yeah. about the specifics? Yeah, so, so uh, and part of that was driven by the fact we needed a greater ambition around exporting. So we've got a minority of our food and drink companies, there's 890 food and drink manufacturers in Scotland, a minority of them are still exporting. Um, but by creating that resource in market and identifying real tangible opportunities and getting beyond the abstract of international market opportunity, but actually bringing customers from Hong Kong and Dubai and New York into Scotland to meet companies, it's helped get more companies thinking about um, exporting. What's then happened happened for, for the likes of some of the craft breweries is very few of them can fill a shipping container themselves, very few of them can employ an export sales manager themselves, but they now do that collaboratively. So there are collaborative groups of brewers who are working collectively. And that's a great offer to go to a hotel or bar chain on, in the Far East and offer a, a, a portfolio of different products. You then pull them from a combination of small companies here, consolidate together, single invoicing, single export sales manager working on their behalf and then going out to market. That's great. Thanks the, much. The, the challenge it's maybe creating is creating more demand than we can maybe mm -hmm. uh, meet. Yes. So that's the longer term um, issue. Perhaps the last word on this point to Willie McLeod yeah. and then we move on to questions I'll from Andy Whiteman. Try and be brief. Um, it's uh, probably small in the overall scheme of things, but nonetheless significant. And uh, if I may, I'll go back to labour market and skills issue. Uh, about four years ago, a group of hotels in Scotland, uh, including Glen Eagles, the Torridon, um, Cameron House, sadly now uh, suffering from fire damage, uh, the principal hotel group and others, Apex Hotels, Edinburgh-based, uh, embarked on uh, the Scottish Apprenticeship and Hospitality, which saw these companies bring an intake of... Um, uh, youngsters straight from school who wanted to follow a vocational training route rather than uh, an academic uh, route by going to further and higher education. And they follow a structured two-year apprenticeship 
um, where uh, they can move from uh, between the participating hotels. They're given a grounding in housekeeping and food and beverage in front of house. They experience uh, some of the back office functions of marketing and, and other um, uh, normal administrative functions. Uh, and that has been a highly successful uh, venture over the last four years, which uh, these companies are determined will continue. And a week ago, I went to uh, an event in Glasgow that saw the handover from uh, one group of apprentices to the other. And I have to say, I was very impressed by the, the confidence, the caliber, the capability, and the, the way that these youngsters saw an opportunity in our industry. And I think that is a massive success story. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. I wonder if you could say a little bit more, uh, particularly looking at the tourism economy, about some of the disruptive technologies, things like Airbnb, and, and what um, opportunities or challenges that poses, and also how we deal with the fact that um, there is evidence that the impact of tourism is, is costing Scotland. One thinks of last summer on Sky, there's pretty good evidence that, that is not, um, the, in, the, the infrastructure there is not capable of supporting the high quality tourism offer that I'm sure Scotland would like to, to offer. So how do we better plan for investment and how can we deal with or indeed take advantage of disruptive technologies? Who would like to go first on that? Willie McLeod. I'll have a go then. Um, whether the disruptive technologies or not, I think it's a matter of definition, but probably uh, our industry over recent years has experienced, uh, I'll pick on maybe two, um, the online travel agents that we uh, all use to uh, increasingly book our, our holidays and uh, our hotel accommodation, whether we're traveling for uh, leisure uh, or, or business purposes. Um, I think uh, what we have is, uh, uh, in some respects, a grudging partnership, but, uh, but I think if one looks at it more objectively, a, a symbiotic relationship between uh, hotel operators and, and online travel agents. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we probably weren't using them to any material extent. Now we're very dependent on them. And uh, the, the, there have been issues. Um, uh, I think we're able to sell a great deal of inventory uh, through uh, these third-party sites. Uh, correctly, they take a commission for uh, delivering that service and delivering customers to us. Uh, amongst the main issues we've had, and it's, uh, it, it's lessening as a problem, uh, we, uh, the, the online travel agents have um, rate parity clauses in their agreement with hotel companies, which effectively, in, in shorthand, mean you, you cannot sell a room at a lower rate than you offer it on the, the, the third-party site. Uh, now, that, uh, the, some of the restrictions there have um, uh, eased quite considerably through negotiations between larger hotel companies and the the third-party sites they use. Um, some of it is coming about by uh, greater interest from the competition authorities in looking at the fairness of these contracts. Uh, and I think the, just having had a session with the Competition and Markets Authority in, in Edinburgh a couple of weeks ago, uh, they're probably less concerned about the uh, competitive uh, issues to do uh, between the, the businesses that are, are doing business that way. Uh, and more concerned a bit with ensuring that the online travel agents are uh, dealing fairly with consumers by being absolutely transparent uh, with the way they offer uh, product to, to consumers. So I think uh, that's one major disruptor that uh, our industry has dealt with. Um, it's had the side effect of making uh, our businesses a lot sharper with uh, their own booking engines, their property management systems, their websites in driving traffic direct to their own booking engines uh, so they're not paying commission uh, and uh, that, that's had the effect of a lot of investment in new technology. Um, turning very briefly to um, not just Airbnb but if you like home sharing sites, um, Airbnb I think is rapidly becoming the the generic term for, for home sharing, their um, other products and services are available. Uh, but I, I think um, uh, as an industry, we're not unduly concerned about the competition that that offers. That's a new form of accommodation. In fact, many, if much of that type of accommodation has 
always been available informally, um, informal bed and breakfast, informal uh, flats being let during the festival in Edinburgh. Um, I think uh, what, what we perceive is that uh, technology and innovation uh, and entrepreneurialism are moving faster than the regulatory regime can. And uh, our view would be that uh, home sharing is probably not as uh, well regulated, not as transparent as it could be, and uh, that maybe in some instances the, the planning regime uh, needs a bit of overhaul in terms of uh, use classification to, uh, to level out the playing field. Malcolm Rufford. Yeah, I, I think there are two, two, two issues there. One, one is about embracing technology and how, how do you utilise that um, for the greater good. Uh, and just turning to, to that particular issue, you look at examples in Amsterdam and Barcelona where they worked with the, the protagonists and came to a, a, a conclusion that that was beneficial to the, the overall industry and relieved some, some of the issues. The other, the other aspect which you mentioned about over-tourism, I mean, we're, we're not in a, a Venice-type situation. I mean, there, there are, and it's actually in many ways it's a victim of success, is that we, we do have certain pinch points at points in time uh, and obviously you, you referred to Sky and the ferry pools and the parking, uh, albeit that the, the community and the, the local authority and the Highlands and Islands Enterprise come up with a solution for that. The, the other area, which I think is a, another great success, is uh, the North Coast 500, which was you know, an industry-led initiative. And it's on the back of that that communities are now getting together to look at how do they improve the infrastructure. And, and sometimes you know, it, it's easy to plan ahead, but you can, you can get uh, taken by surprise just by how fast, because that's the, the kind of viral nature of the world that we live in, just how quickly success can come. So the, the point for me is actually use the data that's available to try and plan ahead and, and invest as much as you can uh, before it happens, but act agilely and fast when it does happen because the, as sure as eggs are eggs, you will never get it 100% right. Mark Crawford. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think, you know, the, the changing world of the traveller is much more experiential travel now. So living like a local, wanting to, to you know, behave uh, like a local um, has obviously risen, uh, you know, created the phenomenon of more people choosing to stay um, in that type of accommodation, self-catering accommodation. I think also from a domestic front as well, we've seen um, with the, uh, the UK market, um, a lot of households being maybe a bit more challenged with their own household budgets. They're choosing to opt for the self-catering approach and do their own thing. As far as managing that, uh, I think Malcolm's absolutely right. When we get technology on the ground and we're able to communicate better and spread people around, uh, then that will eliminate some of the pressure points that we've had and it's getting them to see more of Scotland. And I was in Sky last week speaking at their, national, at their uh, destination conference and there's a lot of really good work uh, being done by the industry group Sky Connect with Highlands and Islands Enterprise and, and Visit Scotland to, to overcome some of the, the learning uh, that they've uh, had, to t had to take on board uh, in this summer. But, you know, victim of our own success. Um, and cruise tourism is probably another one where we've got a huge volume of possibly, you know, a million people coming ashore off cruise ships this summer, if you include the crew. Um, and when you've got that volume of people coming into our ports and harbours, how do we make sure that they get that quality experience and moving around the destinations that they uh, disembark in? Leave it there. All right. Uh, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Scotland's economic strategy identifies uh, six key growth sectors, uh, which includes obviously the sectors that uh, you represent. From your perspective, having this, these designated growth sectors and the growth sector policy around about that, how useful is that? How has it benefited you? Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer that first. I suppose um, our, our view on the advantage of being identified as a growth sector is, is influenced by the fact we are, have been identified as one. I imagine there are, there are many sectors out there that would say that they should be a growth sector and they're not in there. And when we looked at the UK government's industrial strategy when it first came out, they picked what they saw as some winners like aviation, automotive and food and drink wasn't in there, um, you know, which, we, which we felt was a real um, oversight. We weren't going to be a growth sector. 
So back in back in 2007, um, we got a very clear steer from government and the enterprise agencies that our growth was static, uh, weren't really clear what the, the size of the prize was, um, so they were going to back other, other horses, unless we as an industry could get together, could collaborate more and be very clear on what the opportunities were and what the priorities were. Um, so that the, the, the biggest advantage that uh, initial identification of growth sectors uh, had was to kick our sector up the backside, to be honest, uh, and work much more collaboratively, work, work much more closely and consider much more the, the long-term opportunities versus some of the short-term challenges we've had. So that initial process actually of identifying growth sectors has, in hindsight, been a huge catalyst for, for what's then happened in terms of us working collectively. Um, I, I, think it, you know, I think it gives a real focus. My, my thought about the next phase of that process and the next phase of Scotland's economic opportunities is much more about how sectors work collectively. Uh, how we can certainly build Scotland's uh, business proposition and Scotland's brand. I mean, our, our future in food and drink is completely interlinked with the future of, of tourism. You know, one in every five pounds of tourism tourists spend when they come to Scotland or visit Scotland is on food and drink. The same markets we want to sell products to are exactly the same markets we want to attract visitors from. Uh, and I think the next phase should be about thinking how we can get our key sectors to collaborate and work and work much more closely. But the, the process of identifying growth sectors uh, was a huge catalyst for action for our industry. And then the support we've had from the public sector um, has been hugely valuable over that piece because they've been willing to give us the space to write the strategy and then they then align their activity behind it. And that's a really good model and, and in my experience, quite unusual. In this particular sector, you're giving a very optimistic view, but I'm looking at some figures here that show that uh, in the food and drink sector, job, jobs are actually down by something like 4,000. And uh, the, the gross value added is down by 2.6%. This is between, this is in 2015, 16 figures. How, do, how does that equate with your optimism and the expansion of exports and all the rest of it? Yeah, so, so we've had real fluctu fluctuations over time. GVA, I think, has risen from something like 3.8, 3.9 billion up to, I think, it, the figures you're in front of you, we ran about 5.2 billion, mm -hmm. I think you'll have there. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a slight drop in 2016 compared to, to 2015. Um, from a jobs point of view, we're employing 120,000 now. Again, there are fluctuations from year to year, but we, uh, we've identified with Skills Development Scotland 27,000 new roles that need filled between now and 2022. So there are absolutely fluctuations from, from year to year. Um, you know, huge pressure put on our pelagic sector when we had Russian import embargoes. Um, you know, so various um, volatility that, uh, that sits out there, particularly in, in global markets, um, that affect us from year to year. But our view is that the underlying long-term proposition looks good. And indeed, over that 10-year framework, with which the original question was asked, the trajectory has been upwards, but absolutely will be year-to-year -year fluctuations. And I think Willie McLeod wanted to come in on this. I think the, the designation of tourism as one of the, the key sectors of the Scottish economy has had a very significant impact in uh, what we've heard earlier, the coming together of public and private and voluntary sectors uh, to support our industry. And I think also we've benefited greatly from the, the very clear uh, support for tourism uh, that the government uh, ha has given us as an industry. Um, I know that my colleagues in London and, for that matter, in Cardiff would be are looking very enviously at the, the fact that tourism uh, is regarded as a key sector in Scotland. Um, in Westminster, um, tourism is not that well regarded and probably should be, uh, but in Scotland we benefit from the fact that it is regarded and I think it's been very good for, for supporting and encouraging investment and giving confidence to businesses. But again, picking up on the point you made there, in 2016 Scotland had 2.75 million overseas visitors. In the same period, Ireland had 10 million. Seems a bit of a disparity. That, that yeah. particular one. The, the, the Irish statistics take into account the whole of the UK. So, um, were you to, to ha if you were to look at those coming from south of the border as being separate, then actually the figures would not look so distorted because the domestic market in Ireland is actually very, very small, whereas we have a very large domestic market, which is why the percentage. Uh, of UK visitors is so strong yeah. in, in terms of Scottish tourism. So it's just, it's not quite comparing apples and apples. So, so just to be clear, the 10 million, the, the 2.75 million that Scotland welcomes, 
are external to the UK. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Just, just, <laughs> just to touch on one other thing, um, and James Withers actually uh, touched on this also. Is there? A, do you feel in, in your individual sectors there's sufficient confidence and support for goods and services to be exported? that the companies are focused on this, that they're keen to do this, to get involved in international markets? I, I think we're an unrecognised export sector. Um, I, I think uh, the, the fact that tourism, hotels, restaurants, uh, we're providing services to foreign visitors, we're, we're an unseen, unrecognised export sector. In fact, we're the... Uh, and in fact, you gave me a wonderful entree uh, with your... A comparison with the Republic of Ireland, we're one of the only export sectors that charges our customers VAT. And one of the reasons for uh, growth in numbers in the Republic of Ireland is that they charge 9% VAT on a hotel room. In Scotland, we charge 20%. So one of our major campaigns as an industry is to get parity of VAT treatment with uh, our European competitors. We're one of only three countries in the EU that doesn't have a reduced rate of VAT on hotel and tourism services. We're about twice the average rate. The average rate in the EU is 10%. Uh, there's the UK, Denmark and Slovakia, Slovenia, I beg your pardon, uh, are the only three countries that don't have a reduced rate of VAT on tourism services. And it actually makes us uh, uncompetitive in price terms with some of our close competitors. And I think Gareth Wynne wanted to come in on that point. Yeah, just on, on exports, um, I think we've got a, a quite a strong story to tell with um, in the order of £12 billion a year of exports from our supply chain um, companies. And I think it's an area of, of, of significant upside potential for the future. Um, the, there's, a, there's a lot of expertise here in Scotland um, in, in uh, subsea engineering, in um, oil field services and and related disciplines, uh, which are highly exportable as well as as well as some manufacturing, um, and that's a key part of the uh, vision 2035 uh, that the industry is setting about doing. And we think there's about there, there could be up to 500 billion to be to be gone after in the period between now and 2035. So I think there's a huge opportunity, and that comes both from the diversification into other forms of energy, renewables in particular, obviously, um, but also, but also, um, but also, uh, just taking uh, taking the oil uh, expertise uh, into other basins around the world. And a follow up from Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you very much, um, William McLeod. Uh, mentioned um, VAT. I was just actually just interested on the tax side, uh, whether it's VAT or um, there have also been changes to income tax in in Scotland, or there will be um, fuel duty for for the oil and gas sector, and and even proposed tourism taxes in certain areas where perhaps there's pressure or need for infrastructure. Um, I was just wondering if you could very very briefly outline the kind of relationship between your sectors and tax increases reductions. I'll go, I'll go first since I've been quiet for a while. Um, for us, it's all about the locus with our consumers, and it's particularly about the impact probably on consumers on kind of average and lower earnings, where we see the particular impact. And that's relevant, obviously, for income tax. We know at the moment, obviously, consumer household disposable income is pretty flat anyway. Last year, we saw um, the consumer price index showing inflation. We specifically saw food inflation. We track it as about 2%. And that actually led to a big shift in spending patterns. We know households are absolutely on the edge of their spending. And I think probably the, the broad point we would make is that ultimately if there are increases on uh, income of our consumers, they're going to have less money to be spending in our shops. And, and if, if we're honest, we'd probably rather they were buying things from us than it was necessarily going directly in taxation, particularly for those two kind of groups of workers I particularly uh, addressed there. To that point, um, and uh, I think uh, in, in terms of the differential rates of income tax in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK, uh, as with the military, um, I've spoken to the managing director recently of uh, a large Scottish-based uh, hotel company that operates throughout the UK, and they have some concern about the impact of the differential rates of in income tax on bringing people from England uh, to positions in Scotland and uh, looking at how they reward them uh, appropriately uh, when they, they relocate and to encourage them to relocate. All right, we'll move on to a question from Kezia Dugdale. Thanks, convener. Good morning. 
um, I'm just conscious that we've uh, spent the last few while um, listening to men talk about um, the economy. So can I ask you to give us your understanding of uh, the role of tackling gender inequality within your sectors and industries in order to drive Scotland's economic performance? I, I lead an organisation and I am the only man in it. So first and foremost, uh, which is good, um, we have um, you know, a huge number of very successful women working in our industry and actually you know, speaking earlier about talking to the colleges and going out, it was very encouraging to see a number of you know, huge, probably the majority of younger women coming into the industry uh, or looking to come into the industry. We have a, a very strong voice now in women in tourism who've established themselves uh, and are, are at the forefront of most of the conversations that we have. Um, and you know we're a, we're a sector that offers a, a huge diverse range of employment and certainly there is no uh, reason or any of us would choose to shut out that opportunity and create the variety. Some of our probably finest hotel managers in Scotland are, are leading lights um, and uh, we celebrated the first Women in Tourism Awards dinner this year, about 300 ladies attended um, and obviously our own cabinet secretary being a woman who was there to present the awards. So uh, we're a career of choice for everybody. Um, and uh, that is a very, very clear message that we put out to all. That's clearly a comment about the representation of women within your sector, but I'm asking more generally about the opportunities for women that are linked to Scotland's economic progress. So do you feel that you've, you've peaked, you can do everything you can to help women access the labour market, or what else would you like to do? I mean, it's the future that I'm inviting colleagues to comment on. I, th I think we can we can always do more, I and mean, we have a number of you know a number of opportunities, and they're in abundance, and it's highlighting those opportunities and making them visible to everybody. And you know, I do go back to right at the early stages of of education. I think you know we need to make sure that those opportunities are spelt out to um, you know all genders that uh, you know those career opportunities exist, uh, and it isn't a stereotypical um, sector. You know, chefs are uh, come in, in in all shapes and sizes there, and you know, there's there's great options there. So we will continue to to fly the flag, and I think we, without the diverse workforce that we have, then uh, or having creating a diverse work workforce, we will be on the back foot. Uh, and as Willie pointed out, you know, it's not just a Scottish challenge; it's a UK wide and probably a global challenge as well. Thank you. If, if I go back to uh, my anecdote about the Scottish apprenticeship and hospitality last week, I didn't do an actual head count, but I am pretty sure that the young women matched the young men one for one. And uh, we have uh, some, uh, I mean, some, in fact, the, the hotelier who's chairing the Scottish Apprenticeship and Hospitality, uh, Rohes Ross Bristow, she and her husband jointly run uh, the Torridon Hotel in Wester Ross. So the, there is no uh, barrier. I think uh, our industry has uh, a very good track record of uh, having uh, women rising to the top. I don't want to name names, uh, but not terribly far from where we're sitting at the moment. Uh, the, there are hotel companies being run by uh, very capable um, women. Uh, so I would first of all declare that the chief exec of the British Retail Consortium is female, so we are trying to lead the way on behalf of our industry. I think there's probably two specific points on this. Um, historically, it's been quite a challenge getting female progression in retail because for an awful lot of female workers um, have taken on retail roles as a secondary job. And uh, consequently from that, the priority for them has actually been flexibility rather than necessarily progression. And we're actually trying to change that because the reality is we're losing a huge number of very talented people who haven't wanted to do that. In terms of for the future, flexible job design is a huge part of that, encouraging people into more senior positions, but doing it in a way that lets them balance other commitments they might have, because you know, there is that kind of ongoing challenge. Um, we're making better progress on it, to be honest. There's a lot to do, but we're absolutely committed to improving it, and it is a, a huge challenge. It's an interesting comment to suggest that women have commitments that men don't have. Yeah, it's a historic imbalance, generally, and I completely agree. It's a huge problem that historically what we've seen is that more female um, employees in retail have also had more caregiving responsibilities. That's probably a, a historic and slightly broader point that even I would like to say we can address. But yeah, you're right. And it's something that we certainly don't want to see happening. We want to get, particularly some of the very, very talented female colleagues, get them progressed and get them to go further. Can I, can I jump in for, the, for our industry, which, is, which um, has been, uh, is, well, still is um, not, not properly balanced, um, but it's getting better. Um, uh, the, the the challenge, I think, comes relatively early in the education process. We touched on it a little bit in the last session, but I think the in early early we need more earlier interventions in the education process to get more girls studying 
STEM subjects so that the pool of, of talented people is bigger to choose from in, in the technical disciplines that certainly that our industry needs. Um, we've got there, there are good uh, networks out there campaigning to try to help us to improve the balance and, and pretty much all of our member companies are very active in that space trying to do what they can but we've, we've got a way to go. Um, and, and you know, as you probably know, our, our organisation as well is 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 led by a woman, um, and and she's she's personally very active in helping to 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 keep a focus on this, so, so that we remove the barriers to you know in in making sure that there are the flexible working arrangements that. And to your point, actually, the flexible working arrangements need to apply just as much to the men as to the women, because if the women are going to be able to take their place in the workplace that if, if there are children involved or, or homes to be run someone's got to do that so that's got to be shared and that means the flexibility has to go both on to, to both genders thanks i maybe um, cede my power to julian martin to <laughs> well I, I think julian martin is next up to ask questions so i'll pass it over to done, her maybe me scribbling away it's, so I think it's a very interesting point that uh, flexibility instead of progression was used there, given uh, that one of the, the reasons that my questioning is around inclusive growth and uh, many of the people that have been in front of us uh, talking about inclusive growth has said that flexibility should be something that in order to encourage inclusive growth and to have better economic performance, that it should apply to people who want to actually progress as well and not just the people who are um, uh, in part-time work, for example. So I'm going to ask all of you, um, the links between business growth and inclusive growth, is there a trade-off there? Or do you feel that um, there's actually uh, opportunity in business growth? Now, I'm conscious that hospitality and food and drink have been criticised in the past and the present for precarious work. And can I ask you what you're doing to address precarious work and the gig economy? There's perhaps, uh, <laughs> and so we don't, the uh, gig economy probably much less relevant towards us. Just on, on the flexibility versus progression trade-off, you quite rightly hide up. That came from a port um, we did into um, our, the attitudes of workers a couple of years ago. So it's feedback we got from people that some people wanted to make that trade-off. I completely agree we don't want that trade-off. That's the wrong thing to be happening. We don't want people to be in that position, but they, their priority was that, just to be kind of clear. In terms of point on inclusive growth in the economy, um, I think there's a huge value to it from the retail industry. Ultimately, if people are bringing home higher wages, that's likely to translate into higher consumer spending. And just to kind of nail down the point on, on our perspective on this, I mean, we try and track the manner in which our kind of members do their remuneration. They tend to use a total reward package rather than just pay rates. And that total reward package last year was £9.34. That includes holiday pay, pension contributions, and so forth. The average wage, incidentally, across the UK, £8.36. And there's a pile of other kind of non-financial benefits too. So we absolutely get the point about wages. We've seen wages going up. They went up 2.9% in the industry last year. So we certainly see that we need to pay workers more. We think there's huge benefits for the broader economy if you're seeing greater translation into that. I think my, our sense as an industry is that attitudes to issues around inclusive growth are changing quite rapidly. I, I would probably draw a parallel maybe with attitudes towards environmental performance. So maybe 15 years ago, uh, the environmental strategy of a company was the responsibility of the CSR department or corporate affairs. It was seen as something you had to do as opposed to it being a core part of good business activity and a core um, part of business success. And that's changed very, uh, you know, that's changed rapidly over the last 10 to 15 years. I think inclusive growth and um, Wider commitments to workforce again was seen, you know, a few years ago, uh, and, and perhaps still by some as an act of CSR and good uh, citizenship. Whereas I think increasingly now um, it's seen as absolutely integral to um, business success. And you know, in the food and drink industry, like tourism and others, we'll say, how do we attract the future workforce? And the reality is going to have to be about a much broader set of um, commitments you make to that workforce. Um, for us, that's about health and well-being. 
uh, as well. It's about um, gender equality, uh, LGBT rights. It's about career progression and commitment to that progression. And our sense is that if we're going to attract that or fill that 27,000 job gap that we think in the next five years, we're going to have to make a broader commitment to that. Now, what we've said as an industry strategy, we've used, we haven't used the word inclusive, we've used the word responsible. So we've said we want to be a world leader in responsible, profitable growth. And I think there's a lot more thinking that we need to do as a sector into what that actually uh, what that actually means and how we uh, translate that into practice. Um, but a huge part of it will be about, I think, a broader set of commitments to to our workforce beyond just good pay, sensible contracts and, and, and um, appropriate terms. Will Lou McLeod. As an industry, uh, particularly hotels operating 24-7, 365 days a year, we have to be flexible. Uh, if we have unduly rigid shift patterns, for example, and we're not flexible, taking into account uh, people's family and other commitments, um, we probably can't operate. And I think over, over recent years, I think we've seen businesses becoming a lot more flexible about how they respond both to, to the demands on male and female employees out, out with work. Uh, I think there's uh, more incidence of job sharing um, we obviously we're we're operating at weekends. We're operating on public holidays, so we have to have uh, a degree of flexibility to uh, bring the labour in when we need it. And it's not just at service level; it's uh, it's at all roles in the organisation. We have to run our businesses 24/7, mm -hmm. and uh, we only do that with flexibility and and some innovative ways of. Uh, looking at, uh, at shift patterns, we're seeing some restaurants, for example, um, uh, changing to uh, four-day operation or five-day operation or um, moving away from uh, being open all day to open during the evening, really in many respects to respond to labour market issues but also to respond to um, individuals' needs and give them a better work-life balance. Can you see that, I mean, I, I get your point you're making, you have to sort of uh, work with demand and, and, and have a flexibility around this, the work patterns that people have, but can you see that there's maybe um, some instances of job security not being something that is offered as a result of this? And that's possibly leading people to not want to go into your industry because they see it as precarious. That, that, that's a possibility, and I, I guess you're maybe referring to things like zero-hours contracts there. Um, I, I think... I have to come back, I think, to the demands of our customers for the services we deliver. And in order to uh, respond to customer demands, I think we have to have flexibility of labour. Um, uh, we have never, and indeed, uh, zero, uh, exclusivity clauses in uh, zero-hours contracts were, were banned, and we supported that. Uh, I think the issue is that uh, full-time working doesn't suit everybody. There are people who want, who have two jobs. There are people who have uh, varying demands on their time, and and some flexibility of shift pattern will suit them. It also suits our businesses. In the dark ages when I was running hotels, we didn't have zero hours contracts, but I had a little black book of casual staff because I knew when demand uh, was. Uh, variable and we, we were busy unexpectedly, I had to be able to call on casual staff to be able to fill these gaps. Now that's not necessarily a, a replacement for career progression. Uh, what I am saying is that uh, a contract like that or a part-time contract or a seasonal contract can suit the, the, the individual who agrees to that. I'm interested to hear I think from Gareth Malcolm. Wynne wanted to come in. I, I just wanted to throw something in on the on the gig economy, because although uh, a lot of the focus and discussion around gig economy is on um, lower paid workers within our industry, um, there are a very substantial number of uh, people who are working, who are self-employed, but who are actually very well paid and, and do it by choice um, and make very good livings out of it. So I'm, I just sound a note of caution on... on the, uh, and we have some concerns about the, the tightening of rules around um, people who are self-employed. Um, the IR35 regulations, for example, are, are going to cause some pain for some of our members. Um, so I, I don't have all of the details here today, but I could follow them up with you if, if, if you want more. But I think there is, there is that other end of it, which, uh, which is important too. 
yet we have people who are working in oil and gas for 30 years on a contract basis suddenly getting a phone call and saying they're not asked back and they're out in the, or, or they're, you know, that, that's a protection that they've not had as a result of that and I'm speaking from personal experience of people I know. Well, uh, yes, I, I, I accept that that may, that may well that may well be the case. And uh, however, um, there are also, there are also many many thousands of people who are, who have chosen to be in that in that circumstance and have made a very good living out of doing so. So I, I recognise that there that there are that there are pros and cons to these things. And there and and if you make that choice, it's important to understand uh, that it, that it's um, that it's a that you are effectively accepting accepting some extra risk for it. And I've been in a similar situation myself. Um, so it's um, so I, I recognise the, the point you're making, but there is but there is a but there is a substantial chunk of people making good money out of it as well, and and, and who do it by choice. Yeah, yeah just uh, just to broaden it slightly, I mean, one of our definitions about inclusive growth is also about making sure that everyone has access to to a holiday, who's got the ability to get out and about and enjoy what Scotland's got to offer. And the two, two areas in particular that, that we've been working on with the industry, one is accessible tourism, so people with uh, in, um, disabilities, etc., are not excluded from the tourism industry. Uh, quite apart from the fact that it's the right thing to do, there's also an economic case behind that. There's about £900 million pounds of uh, expenditure goes uh, missing because people are not sure if their particular infirmity can be catered for. Uh, and then there's the other side of that, which is, uh, again, something that, that uh, with the industry we've been uh, delivering with the Family Holiday Association, which has taken children in particular from areas of so social deprivation and given them a break from the circumstances that, that they live in. And I think that's important to remember as well as the, the social good that, that tourism can, can do. Would you say that inclusive growth is potentially something that you've all mentioned issues about recruitment and skills and training for your future would you say that inc inclusive growth is not just a nice to have but is actually probably in terms of attracting people in your industry is a priority absolutely uh, and and uh, you're all working towards that yeah. I think um, you know attraction and retention of of your workforce is, is is huge, and obviously that comes at a cost if you have to churn your workforce, particularly in the rural parts as well. And you know, from a pay point of view, you know, a lot of the hoteliers and the operators there are paying premium a to attract and engage the right people. But it's making sure that they get home. It's making sure that they have that flexibility and keeping keeping them available to you is is vitally important now, and probably even more so than ever has been. Um, seasonality, if we can get our industry trading, um, more of the industry trading all year round um, to provide you know, a, a longer term continuity, that, that's obviously good for us. It, it also you know, alleviates some of the pressure points as well and you know, that's part of the, the wider marketing agenda and the approach that we, we're looking to achieve. I just have one final question. That's a, some of our, our um, panellists from, from a couple of weeks ago mentioned that industry in general is not doing enough in terms of in-work training and relying quite a lot on the university and, and well, education sector to pick that up. Do you see your industries as providing enough in-work training in order to retain people and progress them? Um, we, we conducted a, a, a confidence um, survey about nine months ago. Um, it was not 500 plus businesses completed it from across all sectors of the of the industry. Uh, and if my memory serves me collect correctly, it was as high as 85% was committed to investing in training in their people. Um, it sort of took us by surprise, but I think the recognition that workforce is and retaining a workforce and investing in your people is absolutely key. Uh, and I think the example that Willie gave with the apprentice program that's being run by the hotels is there. So um, I, I've yet to come across uh, uh, a colleague who would say that, uh, you know, we don't train. And I think Linda Johnson was originally on this panel um, or an invitee from Ochrani. And there's a great example of a hotel organisation on an island in a struggling part of you know, a community where you would struggle to attract a workforce possibly of investing in their people. figure there are about 3,000 uh, hospitality and tourism uh, apprentices in Scotland at the moment, and we could probably do with more. Uh, I think the example I gave of the, the apprenticeship in hospitality is just one example of a group of companies coming together to do that. We have some great examples of companies 
uh, that are uh, training, bringing young people on, not necessarily on, apprentices, on apprenticeships, but giving them on-job training and supporting them uh, as, they, as they go through their career. Our industry has always historically taken quite a lot of school leavers or entry-level workers and trained them ourselves, particularly in larger retailers. That's tended to be the approach. And I won't bore you with the litany of chief execs who started pushing uh, supermarket trolleys. I think what has been a big change for our industry is the introduction of the apprenticeship levy a couple of years ago, and particularly the way in which the apprenticeship levy has been transferred into Scotland. Um, to be really candid about this, my members are paying about 12 to 15 million pounds this year. They will pay a similar or greater amount next year, and they have seen very little extra benefit from that spending. So they were previously running apprenticeships, running kind of programs. They are still running many of those, but they are facing an additional burden and cost on that. And I think. Um, reforming and looking again at the apprenticeship levy, particularly the kind of flexible workplace development fund in a way that businesses paying into it can access these things is important. But I have one Scottish member who will spend, I think it's three or four hundred thousand pounds on the levy this year. It's a Scottish business. They will receive de facto no benefit from doing that. That's a huge challenge when we want to do all these things about in training our workers and making them more productive. And that was a point that Gareth Wynne made earlier. And actually, um I'd like to ask Gareth specifically, oil and gas puts a tremendous amount of money into the UK um, Treasury. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see some of that money come back to Scotland in order to help you train for the next generation of, of people working in energy, not just oil and gas, but um, the diversification that you mentioned? Um, I, th I think it, the, the issue for us is, is a UK-wide one. So if, if the... And, and I think the, the, on the industry as a whole is... is has even during the downturn managed to managed to keep up the commitment to apprentices and uh, bringing on bringing in new talent. But we have a, sim a similar concern on the on the apprenticeship levy. The, uh, the bigger the bigger issue for our members is not so much the money the the money that's available. Uh, they don't mind paying that. They're they're happy to do it. But I think they would like to see they would like to see the mechanisms uh, improved so that the training bodies that they are that they find most useful, Opito, for example. Um, who don't who don't qualify, who are not a recognised uh, provider, and therefore uh, you know, it gets in the way of our of our members being able to really get something back for the money they, that they put in on the but apprenticeship. But let's just levy aside. You don't see a need for more money for, that's going to come from oil and gas tax receipts coming back into uh, protecting the industry for the future. Um, to be no, uh, not specifically, no, uh, is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the straightforward answer. However, it doesn't, it doesn't take away the fact that we need to do all the things that we met, that I mentioned in the previous, in the previous session, where, which, is, which is the early interventions to, improve, to increase the pool of STEM qualified, STEM educated um, young people that we, can, that we can encourage into the industry. And I think, I think it's then very significantly up to the industry to set out uh, its stall and to ma and to provide attractive jobs for people to come into, um, and then and then the on and then the in-job training that you referred to a moment ago. Um, so I, th I think that I think there is as much onus on the industry um, to to make itself attractive for young people coming through now as as there as there is on on government to to fund it. I think the you know, the emphasis being in, in so you don't want more funding for that. No. Well. I, the, uh, of course, of course, we need funding. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't, I don't know the numbers well enough um, I here in Scotland to say whether that's the, whether that's the right way to go, uh, or, or what specifically is needed and what it should be for. Uh, I'm happy to write to you afterwards if you like. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, I should say to all the members of the panel, um, feel free to write in to add to your evidence uh, if there's something that you haven't been able to answer here today, but you'd like to, to put something further in in writing. So we'll come finally to questions from Dean Lockhart. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to continue this uh, sort of concept or theme of the impact of policy on your sectors because um, we've, we've heard quite a bit about the apprenticeship levy and how um, that uh, may or may not be working because we've heard in other sessions that economic development is not just about uh, public sector intervention and picking winners. It's about creating a, an environment that is conducive to uh, business development and, and overall economic development. So uh, just looking at recent policy developments, it would be good to get uh, your views on, on the impact of your sectors, and I'm just going to throw out a couple of examples that might be relevant to you. Uh, business rates, uh, the large business supplement, um, excise duty on whiskey, I, I guess, might be relevant. Um, fiscal incentives in the oil and gas sector, 
um, increasing in income tax in Scotland, having a tax differential in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK, and obviously I'd open it up to any other uh, policies that you think may have had either a positive or um, a, an adverse impact on your sector, if, uh, if I could ask that. Well, Lou McLeod. If I could maybe start off with uh, business rates. Um, we have uh, an ongoing concern about the way, the, the manner in which uh, hospitality and licensed businesses are valued for non-domestic rates. And uh, we, we think that that issue, um, although not wholly recognised by the Barclay Review, has been recognised by uh, the Finance Secretary in applying a cap on uh, business rates payable uh, last financial year and, uh, uh, well, the current financial year and next year. Um, the issue for us is that the, the valuations that were uh, reached in April 2017 stand uh, until the next revaluation, and uh, we, are, we will continue to press the case for the, the cap uh, being continued through to the next revaluation. We are, um, I can't say too much at the moment, but we are in dialogue with uh, specialist rating surveyors uh, and with the Scottish Assessors Association about uh, presenting evidence to them uh, about the way in which uh, our businesses are valued. And uh, we think it is flawed and arcane, and uh, we really need to get to a, a more competitive uh, basis for, for rating our businesses. Um, turning to the large business supplement, uh, again, we think it's um, uh, a bit unfair in our larger businesses. A hotel with a rateable value of 51,000 uh, or more is not a large business, yet uh, that pays the supplement of 2.6 pence in the pound uh, to meet the cost of the small business bonus scheme. Um, during our submission to the Barclay Review, we put forward the view that um, all businesses should actually pay something uh, towards local services, and that would remain our view. So, um, Scottish Retail Consortium said quite a lot about business rates over the last year and a half. Um, I'll try and summarise briefly. I think there's probably some very good things. I think the move in the budget to link, few, to link the rise this year to CPI was very positive. That saved our industry five million. We'd like to see that as a permanent arrangement, as the UK government has done. I think much of the reviews in Barclay were really, really good. The move to three-year evaluations we, we called for were very supportive. Just as important the year to the one-year antecedent. That's good. Be interested to know if the kind of well, the Scottish government is going to set that to match what the UK government's done. I think it's 2021 that coming in. Um, obviously, the large business supplement it is a, a burden. It means that the overall rates bill for some Scottish shops will be higher than the comparative shop in England, and that's um, unhelpful when we're trying to businesses are making decisions. I would say that. Um, Obviously, the Barclays suggested that should be brought back into parity. Um, it will be good to get clarity probably at some point on when that's going to happen. It's something we're uh, very, very interested in. Um, and I guess kind of two other areas that particularly... Uh, one thing about rates, I'd say, is that overall we do have a challenge where business rates are becoming a bigger and bigger tax, and as I've said earlier, affecting a smaller and smaller number of properties. Eventually, that's going to have impacts on how much of a return you get or on being put onto higher number one. So I think there's still a wider question about is this actual metric competitive enough? Two other brief points. I've mentioned personal taxation as a government intervention that can have a huge impact on our industry if people have more kind of money. And briefly, because it's not really coming elsewhere, but obviously looming over the public policy environment for all our members is, you know, what is the final Brexit settlement going to look like? A transition deal is obviously a good thing, but, you know, we do need to see a kind of tariff and friction-free relationship if consumers are going to maintain the current benefits they receive. I think from a food and drink perspective, um, business rates has, has you know, caused some uh, real concern. Um, and certainly, if you look at likes of the seafood sector in the northeast, um, it, it's more, I suppose, the, the sudden um, scale of rise and, and hitting uh, pretty quickly, which has caused concern. I won't talk about exercise, duty and whiskey. Uh, SWA will have uh, talked to you at length about that um, over time, uh, I'm sure. And I would echo their, their views on it. I, I think maybe where there are... The, I mean, those are the kind of big headline... Um, tax issues like, and then levy issues like apprenticeship levy. There are also um, 
small and nitty gritty uh, issues on the ground, often at local authority, that it's worth looking at as well. We've we've um, had concerns expressed by a number of food and drink companies about the rising costs of export health certificates, as an example. So, um, to, to use one example, and this is correspondence I've, I've seen, Argyll and Islands Council. Uh, I've told uh, some of their food and drink companies that the cost of an export health certificate, which every single batch of product obviously needs to go abroad, is rising from £17 per certificate to £91. Uh, some single uh, deliveries will have require three different certificates. One seafood business, uh, a well-known export, has written to us. They have about 25 consignments a week. The cost of that small administrative change will be about £100,000 per year. Um, so that's where you know you have uh, we're, we're trying to nationally talk about exporting and promoting that uh, and put all the resource in market and here to build capability but then you have a potential real barrier happening because of a, a resource issue at, at local authorities and small little things like it's not a little thing small administrative charges like that a sudden hike in that with that increase of 400 percent is a huge huge barrier to encouraging more export growth or frankly even holding on to what we've got yeah, I mean, I, I think obviously picking up on what Willie was saying, um, going back to the um, the survey we did on the confidence piece around uh, the costs of doing business just generally rising, it's this compound of costs that uh, continuing to to cause, uh, I suppose, a lot of businesses hesitation to invest and innovate around their product. And we've got a very fast changing world, and the world, you know, tourist expectation is that much greater. Technology investment, as well as uh, for a lot of businesses needing to adapt the product as well. So that uh, uncertainty of where business rates might go um, is, is preventing some from, from investing, and not just in, the, in their product, but in, in possibly restraining uh, investment in their people. But it is the uh, again inconsistencies of planning uh, in certain authorities as well that's been highlighted uh, to allow you know create a much better um, I suppose, uh, consistency across across Scotland would be better and more efficient to allow you know um, that that confidence to invest in the asset and importantly remain competitive and I think that comes back to our competitiveness as a destination it's not just about being price competitive it's being competitive in the quality of the offer and the people and the product that we produce Any further comment? Or is very well. Okay, thank All you. Right, then. If I may, so, I'll uh, be very a, final, a final word to um, you. Th th I mean, we, I mean, we are watching uh, a number of uh, policy issues as they develop at the moment. Um, and, uh, for example, the uh, deposit return scheme on single-use drinks containers is a concern uh, for the retail sector as well as it is for hospitality and licensed businesses. In fact, uh, we're participating in workshops yesterday and tomorrow uh, with Zero Waste Scotland and that, so there's more to unravel there, but there, there is concern about how that might operate. Uh, also, um, the good things looking at um, how we look at diet, nutrition and obesity in Scotland, um, uh, some of the proposals to regulate um, are going to be very, very difficult to uh, deal with and to monitor and enforce if they go through. So again, we're participating uh, in discussion with uh, the government and Food Standards Scotland on, on these issues. Uh, and the final thing is the vexatious issue of uh, the possible introduction of a tourist tax. Mm. Um, and uh, while we welcome the, the Scottish government's stated position on that, uh, we're very concerned about the, the impact of uh, an additional tax on our consumers, mm. uh, which will make us uh, even less price competitive than we are. Uh, last year, the World Economic Forum produced a league table of the price competitiveness of tourism destinations internationally. And the UK comes 135th out of 136 countries. So adding costs to our consumers uh, is going to make us less competitive. And uh, uh, let's not forget that uh, price, price is a determinant on people's decisions and our consumers uh, in tourism terms are not without choice of destination. Right, well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of the panel for coming in today, and I'll now suspend this meeting.